one. Hello, and welcome everyone to the Southern Region tonight. We're getting a, just a touch late. We had some technical difficulties, but I think we've got those straightened out. So I wanna welcome everybody, appreciate everybody being here. Uh, it's a little more, the room's a little more full than we're used to, so that's good. We like having that public input. Uh, let's go ahead and just start right off the first item on the agenda. Um, we just wanna welcome the RAC, introduce the RAC procedure. If we could start down at the end, Riley, if you want to just introduce yourself and who you represent, and then we'll come right down the row here. Riley Roberts, sportsman. Greg Lobb from Agriculture. Uh, Austin Atkinson from Cedar City, uh, public at large. Verlin King from Bicknell Agriculture. And Braden Richmond, representing sportsman from Beaver, Utah. Kevin Bunnell, I'm the regional supervisor for the division in Southern Utah. Dan Fletcher, Bureau of Land Management. Chuck Chamberlain with the Forest Service. Dean Boardman, Hinkley, Utah, public at large. Nick Jorgensen, St. George, Utah, representing the non-consumptives. Bart, would you mind going and then Chad? Bart Batista, can have Utah non-consumptive. Chad Utley, St. George, Utah, public at large. Great, appreciate you joining us online. Uh, Tammy Pearson is not with us currently. She's on a trip and she's gonna try to log in if she can. So we'll see, she may join uh, or not as we go along. So just a couple reminders on the RAC procedure. Uh, just we'll follow the normal procedure tonight. As we go through the agenda items, we'll uh, have a brief opportunity to just get updated on those. We've had the presentations online. We hope that everybody had a chance to watch those presentations. That's kind of the expectation. Um, we don't want to revisit the entire presentation, but we'll allow the presenter to just give us a brief overview, at which time we'll have questions from the RAC, then we'll have questions from the public, then we will go over the input that we have, we received online, and then we'll have uh, comments from the RAC, at which point we'll make some proposals and motions. So that's the general layout. Um, with that, we'll go to the first action item, the approval of the agenda and the minutes. Entertain a motion on that, or if we have any questions, we can do that. Approval. Okay, so Craig's made a motion to approve the agenda and the minutes. We have a second? Thanks. Second. I think Nick beat you all. We had a lot of seconds coming, but we've got a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, motion passes. Uh, next item, the wildlife board meeting update. So let me just go through that uh, quickly. Uh, the last board meeting was the antlerless meeting, um, antlerless permit recommendations. That was, a, yeah, it was all big game. You're right. Big game and antlerless, sorry. So let me just go through the motions and, and what took place in that meeting. So there was a motion to uh, approve the buck deer permit recommendations as presented by the division. That passed unanimously. There was a motion, motion to increase bullock tags on the beaver unit to 76 and allocate them proportionately. Uh, that failed. Then there was a second motion to increase the bull tags on the beaver unit to 65, and that passed with one opposed. Um, just a reminder, that's the motion that we made in this rack uh, with a lot of discussion on that beaver unit. So uh, we do appreciate the board looking at that and, and discussing that. Uh, next motion was that we approve the remaining elk and pronghorn permit recommendations as presented by the division, and that passed unanimously. Another motion that we reduce the nine mile Jack Creek Bighorn sheep permits from three to two and increase the North Slope, the North Slope, South Slope, High Uinta Central Archery Mountain Goat permit from one to two. That passed unanimously. <coughs> Next motion was to renew the five year plan for removal of additional bison on Andalp Island and the remainder of the recommendations as presented by the division. That passed unanimously. Um, on the Anderless permit recommendations, there was a motion to approve as presented. That passed unanimously. On the CWMU Anderless permit recommendations, there was a motion to approve the Anderless permit recommendations as presented. And that passed four in favor with two recusals. On the Bighorn sheep season dates for conservation permits, there was a motion to approve the Bighorn season, season dates for conservation permit recommendations as presented, and that passed unanimously. Um, it's a good meeting. It was 
I think it says a lot about where we're at right now with the division. This used to be one of the big meetings of the year, kind of controversial, a lot of discussion. And watching the racks and the big game board meeting, there just weren't a lot of changes. I think that speaks um, to a lot of better communication. We're working together better, and I think it's been very helpful. I think it's a good indication that things are going well. Uh, maybe our herds aren't going well, but the communication and, and working together is going well, right? So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to you, Kevin, for an update from the region. Okay, Mike, could you pull up my pre that presentation, please? All right, thank you. And I need to thank my managers for putting this together for me and Adam for putting some really nice pictures on there. Uh, Mike, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Start with our wildlife section. Next slide. Um, I mentioned the last time we were here that we've been working on sage grouse select counts. We've finished those. Um, the overall trend is up, which is a really good sign. Last year, we didn't have a sage grouse hunt on the Parker Mountain. We're, we still haven't made that decision for this year, but um, it's at least a, a possibility, I think, for this coming year, given the, the let counts that we had. Um, pheasant chicks for the Richmond and Pavant and Bicknell WMAs are, are, have arrived and, were, and are in the pens being raised. We do have some deer mortality still occurring, but survival is a lot higher than last than it was last year at this time. Um, our biologists are out doing spring range assessments. We do have some deer and elk depredation issues around the region. Um, I think I started to type something there and then got distracted, so I'm not sure what that EVER is. But um, most of I hope most of you have heard that our director is going to be coming around the state doing. Um, what he's what we're, we're calling a listening tour, particularly focused on on mule deer herds and, and what's going on with our mule deer. The first two of those are here in the southern region. The first one's tomorrow night in Cedar City, and then we'll be in Annabella or back here in Sevier County in Annabella a week um, a week from tomorrow. So I hope that that word gets out and that we we there's there's no sense us putting these on unless we get a lot of people coming and, and sharing their thoughts. So hopefully the, the word's gotten out and, and you guys will help spread it. Let's go to the next slide, please, Mike. Um, from kind of our, our conservation side, um, we're doing bat surveys right now, testing for white nose syndrome, which is a, a really awful disease that's wiped out millions and millions of bats across the, across the country. It hasn't arrived here yet in Utah, and we hope that it doesn't. Um, those are both hoary bats, and you can see the difference between a young bat and an old bat with their teeth there. Um, same way that, that teeth wear on, on deer and elk. Um, we're doing breeding bird surveys, um, spring rabbit surveys. Our Utah prairie dog counts have, have begun, and I'm, I'm happy to report that so far those numbers are up as well, which gives us a lot more flexibility in, in our, our management if that continues. And our, our coyote bounty check check-ins have been pretty slow um, through the region, so not sure what to make of that. Let's go to the next slide. Aquatics, um, our aquatics biologists have been out um, doing their gillnet surveys around the, the region. Um, you can see a really nice tiger trout there. So let me just give you the, the rundown. At Penguich Lake, lots of rainbows um, and tiger trout. Um, cutthroat numbers were down a little bit. Uh, very few Utah chubs, which was, that was the reason that we, we treated Penguich Lake back in 2006. And, um, and so the management there with, with putting the tiger trout and the, and the Bear Lake cutthroat um, to which prey on the chubs seems to still be holding strong and, and, and Penguich Lake is in good shape. Um, let's go to the next slide. 
We just finished a review of our Boulder Mountain Sport Fish Plan. Um, had a, a, a big committee there that, that came back together and talked about every lake on the Boulder Mountain, which I think there's 80 something up there. So it, it took a while, but they went through every single lake and the data and, and determined um, how we were gonna manage each individual lake. And it ranges from some lakes are, are managed for opportunity, others for, um, for trophy management, the majority of the lakes are still being managed for, for trophy um, brook trout, which is what the Boulder Mountain is known for. Um, and that, that'll be available online and it has, it lists every lake and how we're managing it. It'll give, give people a, a good opportunity to kind of target the lake that they're going to based on, on the fishing experience that they're hoping to have. So, okay, let's go to the next slide, please. Um, our Washington County field office that deals mostly with the endangered fish issues in the Virgin River. They're doing their spring sampling. They'll be working in the um, non-native monitoring down in the in the Virgin River Gorge with the uh, Arizona Game and Fish, um, working on smallmouth bass management at Quell Creek, um, implementing the Desert Tortoise Habitat Conservation Plan in, in conjunction with Washington County, and then developing a, some summer flow plans. That picture that you see there, that's what connects Quell Creek to Sand Hollow is those two pumps. They can pump water back and forth between those two reservoirs. It's an amazing system, how much control they have on the, on the water down there. Let's go ahead and go to the next. <clears throat> um, they're also working on willow flycatcher monitoring. Um, Gandy Spring is a, is a little spring clear out in the West Desert where we have some spring snails that we're trying to keep off the endangered species list. So we've done some non-native removals there and, and trying to, to make sure we protect the, the spring snails that are there. We'll be doing some non-native removals down in the Escalante River. And then their work, they do a really good job down there getting kids involved with uh, a summer internship. And then um, urban wildlife in Washington County has become a 24 seven um, issue that we deal with. We have somebody on call essentially all day, every day, um, dealing or responding to um, nuisance wildlife issues in Washington County. Let's go to the next slide. From our habitat section, Next slide, please. Some ongoing projects. The, we finished um, fencing Bicknell Bottoms actually yesterday. Um, we had a land trade over there that, that required some, some additional fencing, and so that was finished today. That We've hauled water out to some sheep guzzlers out at Blake's Lambing Ground. Um, that, that guzzler's really important to our bighorn sheep. It was repaired last year, um, but it didn't get enough water to, to make it functional, so we, we took a water truck out and filled it. Um, Yankee Meadows will be open by, by Memorial Day. Um, we're working on fencing the, the Pavant WMA. And then there will be a Habitat Council tour. This is particularly for the RAC members on August 11th on the Monroe. And, it, and any of the RAC members that are interested are, are welcome to attend that. Um, we started irrigating, oh, started irrigating some of our WMAs. Um, that picture there is a, is a pivot that we, we put on the Elbow Ranch WMA, um, and then planted a, a, a seed mix, particularly to try to attract deer and elk um, and try to shortstop them from the fields down in Marysville. Um, initial reports are that that's, that's working. We had a lot of deer and elk use on, the, on that pivot this, this spring and, and, and late fall. And then we have started grazing our WMAs. Those permits usually go from May 15th to June 15th. Go ahead. From our outreach section, um, there will be a shooting sports clinic coming up next week down in, at the Purgatory Shooting Range in Washington County, um, the Color Country Natural Resource Camp up at Panguitch Lake, the end of May and first part of June, and then they're working on highlighting um, projects that, such as the, the, the white nose um, white nose testing in bats that it's um, that are our non our native. Um, folks are working on. Go ahead to the next slide. From law enforcement, um, so we 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 started the the canine program in the southern region um, with Josh Carver was the first canine officer in the in the division. I think he's on his third dog now, Paul, and and just just got back from Minnesota, I believe, with with a new dog, and and this program has been amazing. Um, <clears throat> 
our officers are, are investigating a buck pronghorn that was poached near Cedar City. You may have seen some, some media on that and we're, we're hoping to get some tips. Um, this time of year, officers are really busy investigating deadheads um, that, are, that people find when they're out hunting for, for shed antlers. We've got 97 that we're working through. It's, it's gonna take a little while, but, but they'll get to every one of those and, and work through them with the person that found it on whether they can, they can take possession of that or not. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. That's all I have. Um, be happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Go ahead. It is at um, at SUU in the same building where we had our last rack meeting. It's not in the same room, but in that same, you'll it'll be obvious where we're at. So, go ahead, Gene. Um, is, how's your uh, rabbit uh, investigation going? Teresa, do you want to comment on that? There's nothing new that I have heard about. Oh, where's the? We don't have any new information. I can reach out to our vet and see if any other uh, dead rabbits have tested positive for the rabbit hemorrhagic, hemorrhagic disease. That's what you're referring to? I think he's just asking about the surveys. Does I'm referring to the fact that there aren't any rabbits. <laughs> Yeah, and, right. and we did have several outbreaks last fall uh, of the RHD. So that's, and it wipes out the vast majority of them. Have you heard any reports on the surveys that are being done right now? Or is it any report back? My, Gene, I'll just say my, it just anecdotally, I think we bottomed out last year. Um, I have seen more rabbits around this year than I, than I, than I did last. In fact, I've seen some, some, really small cottontails. Um, and so there is some some reproduction that's been successful this year, but it'll be a while before we get back to, to good numbers again. Any additional questions from the rack? I just had a question on the restocking of cutthroat trout in the upper mammoth. If you had an update on that. Chad, I don't have an update on that, um, but I will have Richard reach out to you and give you an update. I, one thing I did mean to mention, um, Colob Reservoir looked really good this spring as well. We we um, did a treatment to remove all the non-native fish out of out of Colob a couple of years ago, and it's come back strong and and fish populations look good. But I'll get you an update on on Upper Mammoth, Chad. Thank you. Can we please hold for one sec? We lost our video. Uh, They've got our audio, but no video. One second. We may have to make a rule here in a minute that if you're wearing brown, you don't get the chair until the folks at hand. We're almost there. I think the next person that comes in will trip that. So.
Our next presentation's online anyways. Could we go, could we just jump into that? Hey Mike, our next presentation will be will be presented online with Kyle. Can we go ahead and move on to that since that doesn't require the cameras in the room? Yeah, one second. Oh, he's saying he can see us. Yeah. Okay, let's let's go ahead and do that then. All right, let's go into our next item on here. It's also informational, but we'll turn it over to Kyle Maynard, the Assistant Attorney General, to discuss the conflict of interest. Kyle. Good to see you there. You want to just uh, yeah, good to see you all as well. I, I appreciate you. Let me have a few minutes just to run through a quick update on conflicts of interest. Um, it's it's been about a year since I met all of you at the Rack and Board training, and we went through this. So I figured it was uh, as good a time as any to, to just do a quick refresher and um, go through kind of how to identify conflicts and um, what steps you need to take. So generally, we, we focus on two statutes in Utah Code. Um, 6716 is the Utah Employee Ethics Chapter, um, and 79.2 is Natural Resources. Um, so when you're going through conflicts of interest, we really break them down into two categories um, to be concerned about. We have actual and perceived conflicts of interest. Um, Actual conflicts of interest are ones to be the most concerned about. These are ones that you would need to make a, a declaration of, of what the conflict is and then abstain from voting on that matter. Um, it doesn't mean that you can't vote for the whole meeting, and it doesn't mean that you can't discuss the matter. You just can't vote. Um, some examples of those, and, and all of these are largely financially based. Um, a, a member is an officer, employee, or a director, administrator of an organization or business that uh, may be financially or economically impacted by uh, a matter before the RACA board. Um, a member or their spouse or minor children have a substantial ownership interest in an organization or business that may be financially or impacted by a decision before the RACA board. Um, a substantial interest is defined. It's it's about ten percent or more. Um, next is a member or a member's immediate family may be financially or economically impacted, positively or negatively, uh, in a manner different from the general public. Um, and a member is unable to objectively evaluate and make independent decisions on a proposal. Um, would be a scenario where you'd, you'd need to recuse yourself. Uh, and last, a uh, member has personal investments in an organization or business that will create a substantial conflict between private interest and public responsibilities. So all of those are scenarios where you'd want to declare and abstain from voting. Um, the second category, perceived conflicts, are ones where you have an affiliation or a tie to an organization or business um, but you don't have a leadership role or decision-making role in it. And those are conflicts that may appear to the public to be conflicts of interest. And, and what you'd need to do there is declare those conflicts. Um, and if you feel that your ability to be objective and, and serve um, the public interest in this role, um, you state that affirmatively and you, and you continue on and vote. And so, you know, these are always difficult to identify. And, and, you know, anytime you have something come up before a meeting, feel free to, to give me a call or my door is always open and we can talk through any issues and, and kind of map out where to go. Thank you. Appreciate that, Kyle. Yep. Any questions from the rack? Kyle, what was the first citation that you gave to us? So it's Utah Code 67. Um, so chapter six, uh, 16. So my second question it, is, uh, these are, this is an informational item. So we limit this to just the rack. Um, I think, 
Okay, I, I think what we'd ask you to do though is get with uh, us or Kyle after the meeting. On these informational items, it's it's just the rack discussion. Any any questions from the rack? Go ahead, Berlin. It seems to me that uh, representing agriculture, that Craig and I wouldn't be able to vote on anything. Right. That uh, that question came up at the last rack too, and I I wanted to double check some things and look into it. Um, and so, for rack members in in the wildlife code, we have specific designations, right? So you. One of them is to be an ag representative. Um, and, and that's a scenario where you have a statutory conflict. You're required to have that interest. Um, so what, what would be a good approach is, is if there's a matter that, that you have a concern about to, to shoot me an email or give me a call. And, and the bigger concern that I have is, is what is your personal affiliation? Um, you know, what is the potential that you or, or one of your immediate family members could be financially impacted by a vote? Um, having a membership in uh, like a normal general public membership in an organization is is less worrisome and, and probably more of a perceived conflict. Are, are you good with that, Vernon? Any additional questions? Okay. Craig, go ahead. Uh, from what you said, Vernon and I really can't vote at all because we are very much uh, impacted by wildlife and uh, every day of our lives, and it's financial. So I think we need to figure something out there. Yeah, uh, I, I understand that. And, and like I said, you know, it, it is a, it's a statutory conflict. You know, the, the legislature has, has kind of created the situation that you're, you're in and um, one that we have to work with. Um, and so what we do is, again, you know, it's, look at individual items as they come up and and how if if this is about you as an individual landowner how a vote would be different from you versus anyone else in the general public um and and it's kind of a it really is it's tough it's a case-by-case -case situation um which i know i'm sorry it means you have to talk to the attorney more often but um i think it's it's always something that we can work through and figure out I think those are great questions. Obviously not easy questions either. Go ahead, Austin. I, I don't want to get into hypotheticals or, or what if there, but just trying to understand the layers of how far you take that. For example, if you're representing a sportsman group that's involved in the sale of conservation tags or landowner tags at auction, would could that be a related enough conflict of interest in your research? I think I would want to know what your role in the sportsman's organization is. Um, and you know, then based on what the item is, how that would impact that specific organization. Good questions. Any additional questions? Okay. Thank you, Kyle. We appreciate the offer extended to to contact you anytime and to walk through these things because some of them will be, we may need some more personalized questions. So thank yeah. you for that. Absolutely, anytime. Thank you all. Okay. Let's move on to the first action item tonight, uh, the Upland Game Management Plan. Uh, Heather, would you mind just giving us a brief overview? Uh, again, we uh, hopefully we've all watched the presentations, but if you could just kind of give us some highlights and then we'll go to questions. Sounds good. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Thank you. Can I please just get one technical minute just to, as a, as a I yep. need to rejoin the meeting? We're going to take another uh, a technical minute. Be patient with us. Thank you.
If you finish your comment, Clark, just pass it to your right, and one of us will grab it. Yeah. Well, we for some reason, little here's We are, you guys can send this to me. We're, we're back now. Sorry about that. I apologize. All right. We think we're live again. We'll try the next agenda item. Hopefully it works out. So, Heather, appreciate okay. being patient. We'll give the over to you. No problem. So first, there was an oversight on my part with the rule um, with opening this to asking for two beardless tags and then one hunter's choice. We would need to change some things in our 657-54-12 for the identification of species and sex. The first point under there describes during the spring seasons, the head and beard must remain attached to the carcass of the wild turkey while being transported. So we would just want to strike out that first po portion that says during the spring season, since now we have different permits available. And then completely strike out the section second portion of that, which is during the fall season only, the head must remain attached to the carcass of wild turkey while being transported. So that was just the first thing. And then just to reiterate with these fall permits, we've, we do have individual data for the region, which we can show you. Um, but this is just the fall permits were designed to decrease populations in small localized areas where depredation and nuisance is occurring. So we feel like we would want to decrease those populations in those areas where there are nuisance problems. And um, that's why we're wanting to go forward with a couple of beardless permits since we're taking mostly males in the fall for most of the years. Also, we just wanted to explain that our upland game management plan gives us just some further direction and guidance. And the reason we wanted to bring that forward is if we have measurable objectives and goals and research priorities in that plan, it garners more support for funding those priorities. And then also just to quickly touch on the air guns, um, in case anybody hasn't seen it in the rack packet, we do have minimum requirements set at 2000 PSI for the velocity of a pre-charged pneumatic air rifle. And it must fire at at least um, 30 foot pounds of energy at the muzzle. And the pellet or slug must weigh at least 18 grains and it must be 25 caliber or more. Um, so if it's at least a 25 caliber, we feel like that has drastically increased the chance of lethal harvest and success. And we don't feel like there's a huge concern of wounding loss with that aspect. Also, 
uh, most of the other two racks have asked for a conservation stamp to be attached to the use of an air gun since they do not currently pay the PR excise tax. So if that's something that this rack would like to move forward with as well, just to recapture that excise tax, that would be something that we feel would be accommodating. Thank you, Heather. Go ahead and open up to questions from the rack. Questions for Heather. All right, go ahead, Vernon. So that tax you just mentioned, I, so who gets that? Who gets the money on that? Is that a, I mean, I'm just, I don't understand it. I haven't studied that part, so. From the way that the other racks have passed it, it sounds like it would be either federal or state and just go back into wildlife conservation, uh, distributed the same way that Pittman-Robertson taxes implemented. Verland, are you familiar with Pittman-Robertson or would you like an explanation of what that is? I'm not familiar, but yeah, give me a brief explanation. Just just quickly on the sales on the sale of guns and ammunition and, and archery equipment, there's an excise tax that is assessed at the purchase of the of the firearm or the ammunition or the or the bow. That's collected by the um, through by the IRS and then distributed out to the states, which we which we have to match at a certain rate, and that it helps fund um, wildlife management across the country. So currently, air rifles aren't subject to that, and so this would be a way to assess a similar um, tax so that it so that, that the purchase of air or people that are hunting with air rifles are are still contributing to wildlife uh, management um, like everybody else. Go ahead. Um, do we know what the demand is for air rifle use for for wildlife harvests? Do we? I mean, is it a large demand or is this just a very small group of people? We're assuming it's a smaller group of people that will actually own those air rifles with those minimum requirements that are interested in turkey hunting, but we have not done any kind of formal survey or poll to gather that information. Where this was set forth by the legislature, originally they had wanted to um, allow this for all turkey hunting, and then after further conversations, we felt really grateful that they allowed us the opportunity to help with coming up with these recommendations to bring forward to the Wildlife Board. And the reason that we are recommending the for rabbits and hares and fall turkey is because rimfire firearms are already allowed for those species. So it seemed that it made sense. Heather, I have a question for you. On the fall turkeys, one of the letters we received, I think all the racks received, that was a concern of using the air rifles for fall turkey. But with the uh, qualifications that you just said, you know, it has to be the 25 caliber, that makes it a pretty substantial air rifle. It appears to me that it's very similar to a rimfire. So the question that I would have is going back to the rimfire, could you help us understand why we felt like rimfires were appropriate on the fall turkey to begin with? To me, it seems like they'd be lumped together. If, if we're okay with rimfires, I'm not sure why we wouldn't be okay with their rifles. So my question is, why are we okay with rimfire? Thanks, Braden. So yeah, I wasn't in this position when that was instituted. So I can get more background information for you if needed. But from my understanding, it was a way to help increase the fall harvest and provide more opportunity for those that maybe weren't able to draw out a tag or something like that. And so, you know, a lot of people were using that from what we or people were saying they would like to use that as more of a youth hunt. And that was kind of their their reasoning for wanting to go that route. But I can get more information on that. Do you yeah. want Avery? We have Avery on the line. He probably was around when that was instituted. So I can have him speak to that as well. If he has anything additional he wants to add. I think you actually answered it. But if he has anything additional. We'll take that as a no. Uh -oh. Or you could just take it as I, mean, well, I can. Uh, I think Heather covered it pretty well there, but um, I think a lot of the the push to that was just with the the fall turkey hunt was an attempt to control populations in areas that were having uh, depredation and nuisance issues, and the rim fire looked like it was a way that we could 
uh, help increase harvest in some of those areas, especially in areas with open fields that were hard to uh, kind of spot and stock those fall turkeys on. Great, thank you. Go ahead, Austin. Just a question on this conservation stamp proposal. Do we have a program like that already that we could use it as, as an example? Um, and is the division equipped to handle something like that being started just for a specific weapon type? That's a good question. I don't think we have something like that specific already. I can um, let you know what we did with our pheasants because we did have that habitat stamp. So if you want, I can read you the information on how that became wrapped into our current hunting licenses now. So I know that things like that have been done in the past. That's kind of something that I'm assuming is pretty similar, but I don't know what the current infrastructure would be to handle that now. I had any more questions? You don't get to ask questions. I'm not asking a question, just a point of clarification on this. Any fee that we um, charge has to be approved by the legislature. And so if, you know, Ashley or, or Heather, correct me if I'm wrong, this would be a couple of years before we could implement it because it would have to go through the through the legislature, be voted on and approved before we could, could um, implement that. So it's a good idea, it won't happen immediately. That is correct. It, we're talking about if the wildlife board chooses to approve this, that would go through the next legislative session. Yeah, on the Northern Rack, if I understood correctly, on the Northern Rack, the legislator that sits on that rack said he would take this forward if it were to pass. Additional questions? Go ahead, Vernon. On these pheasants, is, are there any wild population of pheasants in the state of Utah that are huntable, or is it all raise the chicks and turn them out and turn the hunters loose and they'll get some and I run most of them over there in the big bottom. So. <laughs> I appreciate your honesty, Verland. Um, yeah, we do have some wild populations that exist in riparian corridors and with throughout the state, there are some of those do exist, but they are few and far between. And we do, in fact, have that $200,000 a year is a PR grant from the Hunter Education Fund that helps us to purchase those birds to as a put and take only not not to augment populations, but just to increase our, our three efforts. Uh, the pheasants that you do release, are they all uh, rooster pheasants? Mostly. <laughs> Was that a good answer? No, um, there are birds that we raise here in Richfield. That, and I know Vance Mumford can speak more to that, but he does release some hen pheasants as well every year because day old chick, or when we're getting the eggs, you know, we're going to have a mixture of males and females. But the, the birds that we release on our WMAs for the hunts, those are all roosters. Oh. Up in the big bottoms, there's more hens than there are roosters, if you ask me. I mean, side of the road, when ones that maybe they're faster and smarter <laughs> and get away from the hunters. Yeah, I believe there are some wild, isn't there not a wild population down there? Yeah, so there is some wild populations down there. So of course we do have some hens in that area. And they we, we, also do well. we also do release some hens down there. It's similar, we have a, you know, we raise some birds down there and, and there's hens that are released um, on victim bottoms as well. Um, are you doing anything about increasing the boundaries or the hunts for uh, sage grouse? Right now, we are we do have the temporary closure for the Parker sage grouse hunt. If that's the one that you're referring to, and we are reviewing that right now with our data, and then we will bring that recommendation to the board once we have our data all compiled, whether or not to open that this coming September. As far as new new hunts and new boundaries. We have not looked into any of that. We do need to have at least a, um, a breeding population of 500 birds in the high and the low years before we can institute mm -hmm. a new hunt. Well, there's a 
There's populations around, but there aren't very many populations of, of 500 pairs. Uh, it depends, I guess, on, on how you count them. If uh, the population in uh, Bucks, Buckskin is one population, and the population in Johns Valley is another population, we'll never get to 500 pairs. And we might not. And with the with de declining sage grouse population in general, we do have some areas we believe are up this year, but we have seen uh, overall the long-term trend has been down. So we're not necessarily looking to institute any new hunts, but we will be bringing through sage grouse in our three-year guidebook cycle at, during this meeting in 2023. So we can look at new opportunities at that point. Any additional questions? All right, let's open it up to the public. Questions from the public? Go ahead. Uh, when you get up to the mic, if you can state your name and who you're, I guess the comments, we need to know who you represent, but. It's a little short, <laughs> I need to crouch down. That's so you can keep your time short. <laughs> <clears throat> Waylon Pritchett, Sportsman's for Fish and Wildlife. Hi, Heather, how are you? Hi, I'm great. Um, could you explain to me briefly, uh, how are your limited entry permits allocated, such as permit numbers? Is it done by hunter surveys, population counts? We do use the hunter harvest survey as a metric, but we have multiple metrics that go into our turkey permit calculator. So I know that we just sent some of that to the to NWTF as well. So I can pull up some of that information, but we do have a lot of variables and coefficients that we use like habitat abundance, um, the male to female ratio or sur survival through the winter, different metrics like that, that we use to, to extrapolate that. And on those hunter surveys, what seems to be the general consensus, um, let's say from 2018 to 2022, is it, are hunters generally satisfied, unsatisfied? Um, what seems to be the majority? So we do have three different popular, or three different hunting triggers that are now part of our turkey plan, which brings me to, we are opening the turkey plan this year. So we are looking for members to, to have on that committee, and then we will bring the turkey plan through next year. So if there are any concerns and changes that people would like to make, we'd love to hear through that process. But um, yeah, we do, we have not hit any of the triggers at this point. So we have a satisfaction trigger, a crowding trigger, and a success trigger. And at this point, we have not hit any of them. Um, <clears throat> based off information on the division's website, uh, permit numbers for the spring limited entry, here in the Southern region, um, 2018, there was just shy of 2,000 permits, 1,980. Uh, fast forward to 2022, it's down to 595, real close to 1,400 permits. Um, what is the thought on this very drastic decrease on permits? Is it solely drought? Um, could also these hens that are being harvested um, on the fall hunt contribute? Winter predators, uh, is there any... Uh, anything that sticks out of why these permit numbers may be so low? We did originally do some cuts due to drought. So we've seen a lot of hot dry areas during the summertime when the pulps are trying to get all the nutrients they can from, from consuming insects. They have really high protein requirements when they're still growing. So our we do attribute a lot of this to drought and we are tailoring our permits in response to what we're seeing on the ground. And that kind of leads into my next question. Uh, with the southern unit being impacted, impacted so severely by drought, uh, what plans are there in place to, to bring these turkey population numbers back up? So we've been continuing with what we've been doing as far as using our permit calculator for harvest. Also, for the fall hunts, we've already discussed eliminating some of our hunt boundaries, making some smaller adding different caps 
so that we are decreasing our take in the fall as well. And we are still doing lots of WRI projects for turkeys like we do every year. I think that when I pulled that data at the central region, we had about 630 turkey projects that we've been doing through through the years on WRI. But I can also bring up the dollar amounts if you want. Uh, yeah, if you could, that'd okay. be great. One second. So our total amount that we've used for turkey habitat through WRI um, equals $161,131,649. And that encompasses 719,453 terrestrial acres, 23,885 riparian acres, and 2,149 stream miles. There's also been easement acquisition acres, and that totals almost 3,050 acres. So we're always working on turkeys. Perfect. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Are there any more questions from the public? Okay. Uh, Kevin, I'll turn it over to you if you want to review the comments from uh, that came in online. This one's really easy. We had three people submit comments online. One strongly agreed, one somewhat agreed, and one somewhat disagreed. Um, the only comment was relative to the fall turkey hunts, and, and it was along the lines of what we've heard in the other racks. Some people support killing or harvesting hens, others only want us to harvest toms, and, and then others have exactly the the opposite point of view. So it's it's been an interesting one to come through the through the process. So all right, I only have two comment cards. If there's others that want to comment, get a card turned in quickly. Uh, Chuck, representing uh, the Wild Turkey Federation, and then Waylon with Sportsman for Fish and Wildlife. So uh, three minutes for individuals, five minutes for organizations. So you guys have five minutes if you can come to this mic. Hello, everybody. Thank you for your time. My name is Chuck Carpenter. I'm the district biologist for NWTF, the National Wild Turkey Federation, for everybody that doesn't know. Um, so I'm here, I guess, to talk about our stance and then also um, our board. Uh, so we support the division's recommendations. It seems like the fall hunt was put in place for nuisance birds. It kind of went off track and turned into something it wasn't meant to be with the tom harvest being so high this is actually a proactive approach to rein it back into the lane it was designed to be in um, and really with this uh, with the turkey plan opening up this year this is really only going to affect this fall season um, and like heather mentioned they're going to reduce some of the areas here in the southern unit they only harvested 90 96 birds last fall um, so it doesn't affect you guys a lot um, so yeah, we, we'd like to see that continue and kind of rein it back into the nuisance category that it is designed to be. Um, and then our board, I believe, sent out a letter. Uh, they're concerned about air guns being used to harvest birds just because of Pittman Robertson. Um, they don't fall under the taxation of that. And really, if something is to be harvesting wildlife, we feel like it should uh, be taxed and pay into conservation. So that's all. Thank you. Great, thank you. Waylon. Waylon Pritchett, Sportsman's Fish and Wildlife. Uh, thank you guys for allowing me the time to get up here and speak. Um, we we oppose the action of going to two unbearded and one either six sex permit. We don't believe the best solution for a decreasing population and to save more toms for the spring hunt is by shooting more hens. Um, we, we understand the purpose of the fall hunt <clears throat> and like big game, understand the importance uh, landowners play in man managing wildlife populations. Um, we are willing to step in and help provide funding and volunteers for relocation of these nuisance turkeys and uh, winter supplemental feeding in hopes of diverting them from the nuisance conflict areas. Um, we, we believe that 
uh, turkey hunting in general is one of the best opportunities in the state right now for youth and new hunters. Um, we're not suggesting to take the fall hunt away. We are simply suggesting to adjust it to a best address to the declining populations. Um, we feel and I feel from personal experience that in any region in this state that should be most concerned about it is this southern region. Um, definitely something to be proud of. Southern region has housed house the most turkeys populations in this state, but it is rapidly declining. Um, we have spoke with Heather and like to thank her very much for all of her help um, and all the information going into <clears throat> this, this topic. Um, we are really excited to work with her and everyone else on the committee next year um, for the new management plan and Simply right now, we just want to try to come up with the best solution to manage an increasing population for that new management plan rather than a decreasing population. Um, it has been said several times at these different meetings that it's just one year. Well, in all reality, these are up on game. <clears throat> we can lose them to drought, winter, predators without our help or our control. And one year can make a really big difference on these population. Um, uh, earlier this year, <clears throat> I'll, I'll kind of end it with a story. Everybody likes stories. Earlier this year, <clears throat> I bought a Southern region conservation permit, knew that the money would go into funding turkey conservation. I came down here to the beaver unit I've uh, been told for years how many turkeys they are. Braden helped me out, pointed me in directions, went up uh, South Creek. Everybody told me there's tons of turkeys up here. Well, based off what I seen of sign, this there simply was not. Um, very few tracks, did not hear any turkeys. We hightailed it and we went down to Panglitch. Right down, going down the road, fresh turkey tracks. There they were. An hour later, I harvested a big, mature four year old tom. On that tom had a band on his leg. <clears throat> when after I talked to Kyle Christensen, he gave me the information that tom was banded, was caught and banded in the ag fields of Glendale. 45 turkeys <clears throat> were caught and relocated to help repopulate the declining populations there in Panguitch Creek. All those hens that were relocated there will hopefully be bred, hopefully produce poults, and hopefully regrow that population. Um, there is alternatives to, to simply just shooting them. Thank you guys again for your time and appreciate everything. Thank you. Thanks, Waylon. Let that be a lesson to you of how it works down here in southern Utah. Way. Then when a guy from Wasatch Front calls us and asks us where our animals are, we, we, you well, know. You <laughs> <laughs> Oddly enough, they weren't there. I don't know how to help you on that. So. Appreciate it. And Chuck, I just wanted to comment. I appreciate clarifying your stance on the air guns um, uh, because I think that is an issue that I know a lot of people are concerned with Pittman Roberts. I, I appreciate you clarifying that that's where the concern comes from. So thank you. Let's open it up to comments from the rack. When we get time, uh, when we're ready to discuss a motion on this, uh, if we if we wanna hit a couple of the different issues, the air guns, the fall turkey permits, and we wanna break that out, let's do that in separate motions. Uh, if we get to that point, we decide we wanna just take it as it is, then we can just have one motion. So let's kind of see where it goes and what we want to look at, um, but I'll open it up comments from the rack. Boy, we are, we are very excited about turkeys here. Go ahead. I'll make a comment on the air rifle as, as much as I believe in, um, the Wildlife Restoration Act and what we should do there. I would like to see the air guns be recognized at a federal level 
and maybe have that act modified. And I hope there's a group somewhere doing that because I don't trust the federal government to do that of their own accord. But um, I would not be in feeling like we should create another conservation stamp or something else in the state of Utah that a hunter needs to purchase or buy just something else to forget, some other way to criminalize a, a hunter. I feel like that is maybe making it too complicated. I want to keep it simple, especially when we're talking about a fall upland game uh, turkey hunt. So that's my comment on that. Austin, just a, an update on that. Um, my understanding is the Air Rifle Association has lobbied to try to be included in the Pittman-Robertson Act. Um, I think eventually that will happen, but the wheels grind slow. Um, that's kind of where we're at with that. If there's no other comments, I'll chime in on this. I can definitely appreciate the concern. Um, I think it's a very unique situation that brought the Pittman's Robertson Act forward. That was us asking to self-regulate ourselves and tax ourselves. Uh, and that was very intentional. That was to help take care of our wildlife and put those funds back on the ground. It does definitely concern me that we would allow uh, entry in that aren't part of that. Now, I, I hear what you're saying, Austin. I'm not sure I like one more permit off to the side that can catch someone that wasn't paying attention to everything they should buy. But I also am very concerned about not. I, I, I think um, that's what we've asked for before. Uh, the division was asked to allow air guns. It puts us in a weird spot, but um, that's my thoughts. I don't, I, I think we need to push and, and hold our ground. Berlin, we're not going to get out of here in a half hour. You might as well go for it. <laughs> All right. So this Pittman-Roberts Act, it's collected federally, and then they pass it down. So with what you're talking about, that would be collected by the DWR? Or why can't we just wait for them, if they're lobbying for it, wait for them to get on? on board with this other the other stuff i mean i don't think we need to delve into that just let them work through it and get it get it okayed through the, their association or whatever and yeah i'm i'm i don't think we need one more tax on the paperwork and everything else to run it through the state really don't think we should, but that's my comment. Go ahead, Gene. Um, I'd rather talk about the lack of rabbits, but uh, there isn't anything we can do about that. We can't manage rabbits, so we'll skip that one. But uh, to uh, uh, create a conservation tag, uh, need to look at whether the cost of administration wouldn't be greater than the income from the tag. Bart has a comment as well. Go ahead, Bart. I I concur with the comments about we should let it become regulated um, at the federal level and not make a separate stamp for it just i think administrative burdens it's administratively burdensome and i concur with the issues of other people having to buy new um potentially getting in trouble like austin said and i i just we shouldn't allow additional weapons on the landscape if they aren't paying for conservation Please go ahead. Can can I ask a question now, or is it too late? We'll permit it one time. We'll just one barely. Question. I, I'm just I'm thinking about the turkeys, so we're switching from mare rifles to turkeys now. 
and I'm thinking about uh, how hard is it to trap and transport? I mean, how feasible is that to reduce your depredation through trap and transport of, of turkeys? Is that something that's going to be easy to do or is that? It does take quite a bit of manpower. We have done some things recently to make it a little bit easier. So with some trail cameras and some baiting that we can get the traps baited for us, some automatic feeders and that kind of thing, that does definitely help. The other issue though to keep in mind with trapping is if we're having these really dry winters like we've had and there's no snow and they're not congregating, it's we just can't get them to go into a trap. So we really need some good cold snaps with, with some snow to be able to bait them in. Unless the region has anything else they wanted to elaborate on. Jason, you've probably trapped more turkeys than anybody around. Anything you want to add to that? All right. Are we ready to entertain a motion? Anyone want to try to make a motion on this one? Go ahead. I'll make a motion that we accept the proposals as presented by the Division of Wildlife for both turkeys and air rifles. Okay, so we have a motion to accept as presented and a second. Further discussion? I'll add some further discussion. I guess I just want to make sure that you're okay with not requiring air rifles to be under the Pittman Roberts Fund. Well, I'm okay with them being the Pittman Roberts Fund. Well, they aren't currently. I'm okay with, uh, um, what I don't want to do is, is what Austin talked about, create a new permit or new stamp that we need to purchase to go hunting. So I'm, I'm okay leaving the air rifles off of some sort of stampers. Okay. I'm, I'm waiting for Pittman Robertson to adopt it. Just want to make sure we're clear on that. So that would, that would allow air rifle use prior to being taxed with Pittman Roberts, okay? We have a motion a second, any other dis additional discussion? Okay, let's vote. All in favor, raise your hand. G or Bart, are you, yes or no? No. And Chad, yes or no? Yes. So we have one opposed, everybody else is in favor. Bart, um, do you want to state your reason for no? I'm assuming it's the Pittman Roberts. Correct. I don't think that we should allow people to be hunting if they're not contributing to conservation. Okay, thank you. So that passed nine to one, if my counts are accurate. Motion passed nine to one to accept as presented. All right, let's move on to, actually, did, did this gentleman over here in the corner leave, do you know? Was he with you that asked a question on the, um, he must not be with you. Um, okay. On the right. conflict of interest. Sir. I, uh, I, I guess I'll apologize to the room. I got a little uh, sidetracked earlier when he asked me the question kind of out of order. We do allow questions and comments from the public on those, just not during the racks question time. Um, so I should have allowed him to come back and ask his questions after that. So. Uh, I guess I'll apologize to those that are here, even though he already left. Hopefully that's not the reason he left. Won't be the first bad email I've got. Okay, let's go on to the next agenda item, the landowner rule amendment. Um, Chad, again, we all should have watched the presentation. I know that uh, the conversations I've had with those that have watched it is, this was eye-opening to us. There is a lot of information here to dissect. Uh, so if you want to hit the high points for us and without regurgitating everything, that will be helpful. And then we'll, we'll open it up so we can ask you all kinds of questions. Sounds like a plan. I, I was really expecting once Heather's turkey stuff got done that most of this room would clear out, but apparently not. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't blame you if you did. <laughs> So yeah, ju just to, to start out first, um, yeah, I'll try to be brief in this, this summary. It is a really complex rule. Um, we, we tried to simplify it with, with what we did, but I, I wanna first touch on our committee. Um, 
this has kind of come up in some of these other, and hopefully I can make it work, but I, been nice if I could have got it on one page, but this is our committee. Um, and the, the, the middle column is what we, what, who they represented when, when we asked them to be on the committee. And then the, the far right column is, I guess, other. And as, a, as you see, we go down here, we have a lot of landowners in, on this committee um, and people that, that are familiar with private lands. I'll try to go slow, but. And, and you do see one, maybe I already passed him, but Dave Shivers, yeah, I think he's at the top. He's, he's here with us, so thanks for coming, Dave. Um, with, with that being said, uh, hold on, let me just stop presenting. Are you showing the committee of private landowners, the vet committee? For the landowner association rule, yeah, that that was the committee know. member that was that was there. Gene, Gene. or not Gene, Gib, if we can wait a minute, we'll have questions from the public in just a minute. If we can wait. So one other thing is, after the first two racks, they did send out a red line of the rule. I think there was a little bit of confusion there of why we didn't do that at, at first. Um, if you look at it, there's a lot of red in there. So you, at first you think, man, there's a lot of changes. Uh, most of that red was just reorganizing it. Um, the old rule, or the I, it's not the old rule, it's the current rule. If you read it, it's broken out into to general season landowners and landowner appreciation and then limited entry. And then it just keeps repeating over and over. And so it was really hard to, to follow when you read that rule. So most of that red is just a reorganization of that. Um, so in that presentation, I really went back the history of landowner permits, uh, why we're here, landowner programs in general, um, are here to, to show our appreciation of, of what, and recognition of what private lands do for us. Um, but we, we got together a really diverse committee, as you saw, um, and we really hashed out all all of the possibilities that we could think of. But just to make sure that we're clear on this, um, there were some changes we made. So I'll, I'll just break it out between the general season and then the limited entry. So general season permits, these are permits that are, they're not transferable. They, they go to immediate family members or lessees and they're in addition to the tag or to the permits that are given through the draw. So they're on general season units. When we, when we first started these, uh, we had 97,000 tags statewide and we had 3,000 landowner permits statewide. So we just carried over that 3% um, over, over to the, this new, our new proposal. Um, and in that proposal now, because we, one of the things that we hit was specifically here in Southern Utah, we started hitting that limit, the cap of 600. Um, and to try to make things fair for everybody, we're, we're going to put those, uh, the proposal is to put those in a draw um, with 3% additional tags for each unit that would go through a draw that, that you'd be able to, to do. So the thought is, is that you would put in, see if you get your qualifying application in, in March and April, uh, May, when the draw happens, if you didn't draw, then you put in for, for how many, however many that you qualify for up to five um, in that draw. And that one's probably a little bit more straightforward. We have the, the limited entry portion of this um, was a little bit more complicated. What we're running into is, well, we've, we've been having uh, our wildlife board chairs for probably the last 10 so years at least saying that we needed to fix this. Some of the, some of the problems that we're running into is the allocation of, of permits. We'd have, uh, specifically at one time, we had an LOA ask for additional permits because of usage on their land. Um, we actually had two of them that were uh, both in the Northeast region. Maybe, maybe I'm being too specific, but um, 
one of them was granted the additional permits and the other one was told that you just get what the acreage is. So we're just seeing like that that dynamic there of some some would get it and some wouldn't. So that was one of the issues that we were charged to to try to fix. And with that, as you saw in the proposal, the, the fix would be to, just that everybody would go off of a straight object or straight acreage calculation. Uh, that that was the most objective way that we could find to distribute those permits. Um, another part of the of what we what we try to tackle was access. So we didn't really have a good way of tracking public access, um, how many people were being allowed on. Um, with that, we we determined to to have public access come be assigned rather than, I guess. I don't know if I want to say voluntary, but but before it was if if you had a, a limited entry permit, you could go to the LOA and ask for permission and they needed to allow however many permits or vouchers they had, they needed to allow that many people on. This way would be a, a little bit more random. So if you didn't have connections or if you didn't know anybody, you'll be able to, we'll, we'll assign those um, the, the highest draw number. So when you put in for the draw, you get assigned uh, a rank number. So if a if an LOA had five um, vouchers, then the, the people numbered one through five are the ones that would that would be assigned that that public access on the on the LOA. Um, one of the other things that we did on that was it did there in the old rule there was a variance to to not allow public access. And in this proposal, we are proposing that that um, not be in, in the new rule. Um, with that being said, uh, um, the committee worked really hard, really diverse committee. You, you saw who they were. They We tackled every all the issues. We, we talked, it was nine meetings over a year, a lot of long hours of meetings. So uh, th this is the product that we, that the committee and the division is bringing forward and we feel comfortable with that that recommendation. Thank you, Dex. Questions from the rack. <laughs> Sorry, I said Dex, Chad. Sorry. I've been called worse, so <laughs> I don't think yeah. Go ahead, Gene. Okay. On uh landowner appreciation permit if a landowner has land in two different units uh how does that work yeah and just just so i make sure that i'm clear um landowner appreciation so there 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 were before there was general season landowner permits and there were landowner appreciation permits and then there was limited entry so we've combined the landowner appreciation and the general season. So if you qualify for either one of those and you have land in both units, then it would be your choice of, of which one of those two units. So, so you get a choice. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, that'll do for now. I'm trying to keep it on topic and ask a follow up to that where you said he gets to choose if he qualifies as a landowner in both units, he could apply for both, correct? As long as he doesn't validate that permit in his name. So so I was under the assumption there that if he had three, 301 and, and 400 in the other, that's what I was kind of going off of. But yeah, if you if you qualified for a permit in this one in two different ones, then yeah, you could go into both. Go ahead, Craig. Oh. I'm a little uh, PO'd. I told Kevin already about this. Uh, rule R657-262-9, section four, uh, deals with the land that uh, land uh, I, the landowners on the appreciation tag or the general tag, where we can't sell them, 
uh, we've not been uh, had to, you know, lose our preference points if we use that tag. And we this came up a couple of years ago, and the board went with us that we, that we wouldn't have to do it. And then here you put it right back in again a year and a half later. How come? Yeah, that was a discussion that we has had as a committee. We felt like enough has changed even in that short amount of time. Um, so if we just took an example of like the Pine Valley, if you're a landowner putting in for the Pine Valley, it's gonna it's gonna take well if you're if you're a hunter putting in, it's gonna take five years to draw. Um, and then potentially as a landowner, you could draw two other tags during that same amount of time, probably likely even in southern Utah, if, if you're in a northern region unit or anywhere else in the state besides the southern region, you could probably get a landowner permit every year. So you'd be able to hunt five times while you're waiting for for that, for you to draw well, that I'm tag. In, in Pine Valley region uh, unit and we get two tags and the group of us put in and whoever doesn't get a draw a tag, then we split up those two tags. But to me, it makes that, to, if you make us lose our preference points, if we use our landowner tag, it makes those landowner tags absolutely worthless. Absolutely worthless to me. I'd just as soon call Kevin and tell him, come shoot these 20 headed deer that's in my hayfield all summer. So that's that's my point. I think you had the wrong people on the committee. All right, questions, go ahead, Austin. I got a few questions. Um, is it fair to ask, the committee came up with this plan, both these rule changes. Um, is it fair to say, how was that vote? Was it unanimous? Can we get just a glimpse into how that committee uh, finished out when they said, this is our plan, this is what we're okay with. I know some committees go super majority, some just go majority. How did that look for those that weren't there? Yeah, everybody that that was there on the last night when we wrapped up this plan, and I, I assume that's what you're talking about the last night, is everybody was on board with the plan. Keep going. I got quite a few, sorry. Um, we changed from regions to general, 30 general units, what, 10 years ago. Why are we so late in addressing the 600 by region um, permits for general season? It really wasn't an issue until a couple of years ago. Like we, we weren't hitting anywhere near that cap. So there, yeah, we might've been even just oversight of not, not seeing a need for it, but everybody that wanted to,
one. All right, we're back. Our technical difficulties are back up and running and I've been guaranteed that's the last tech, right? Guaranteed, great. Yeah, we've been struggling a little bit tonight. We appreciate your work on that um, and quick, quick results. So let's jump back in. Uh, we were still on questions from the rack. Let's pick it up there and continue with questions from the rack. Uh, I was reminded that I neglected inter or welcome and introduce the board members tonight. Now he stepped out, but uh, Kevin Albrecht is here. He's probably out in the hall talking. And then uh, I noticed that Wade Heaton is online, correct? Yes. Yeah, so just want to acknowledge them, appreciate them for being here. Okay, let's dive back into questions from the rack. Go ahead. So, so you mentioned that we that we went with like 600 tags per region for quite a while, and now now that we've readjusted that, do you, I didn't see maybe I missed it the number. What did we drop to when we when we go to the 30 units, or do are we still at about the same number of tags, or how many limited entry tags did we lose, and how many? Um, general season tag that the landowners lose. Yeah, so so this one would just be general season with that percentage, mm -hmm. and it'd be 3% of what the permits are. So back then we were at 97,000 permits, what we at 74, 75. So I, I think it's just over 2,000. So, but it, that, that will fluctuate every year. So as permits go back up, the that 3% will just add on. If it If we keep cutting, it'll cut with it as well so yeah just thought it was important for it to fluctuate with what permits how permits go for everybody go ahead Austin. is it fair to ask even a rough number how many of the 600 in the southern region were going to pine valley in years past versus the three percent calculation i have for this year is like 51 general season buck permits for this year and I'm curious what that would have been in the past since you said we were approaching or hitting that 600 limit. I've got a little bit of data. It's not um, current, really current. Um, they're like from 2017, 18, 19. Um, on the Pine Valley in 2019, there were 83 landowner permits. The average over that time frame were 79, was 79. And that's when we were at a time of about 4,500 permits on that unit. So 3% of 4,500 is gonna be, you know, 125, 130 permits or something like that. With the permit cuts this year, 1,700 permits on the unit, though there would be about 51. So there would be definitely be some competition this year for those permits. But if I understand the draw correctly, if a landowner applies in the general season draw, he goes in that first, if, if he draws that permit, his landowner permit or entry is still valid because he's just a landowner. He has not validated a general season permit. Do you understand what I'm getting at there? Like he can still, he as an individual goes in the draw in the general season draw, but then his landowner application is considered after. Is that accurate? Yeah, so, because not only the landowner qualifies for that, but also immediate family members and lessees. So if any of those people that qualified for it didn't draw at that point, so so let's just say that that landowner would potentially get up to five permits. If he only has three people that didn't draw that qualify, then he'd just say at that point after the draw that I want to put in for three. Um, if he needed all five, he, at that point he'd say put in for five. <clears throat> Let me jump over to LOAs real quick. Can you give me an example? Like, how big are these landowner associations as far as acreage size? Is that a fair question? And there can only be one per unit. Is that correct? So if if one landowner abstains or says, I don't want to participate, he's just out if he's not big enough for a C-dub. Is that correct? Yeah. And and the, the first part of that question is kind of difficult to answer because it varies a lot. So I'm, I'm just looking at the numbers here. We have Deep Creek that's uh, 1,700 acres. Um, and then we have, oh, I would think that, I'm a, oh yeah, I, I knew Diamond was had to be the biggest one. It's 87,000 acres. So we have them in between 
all the way in between. So I'll, I'll follow up to that. Um, is it a three year renewal and they cannot add or subtract land in that renewal period? Is that accurate? So, yeah, it's been a three year renewal, but yeah, you can, you can amend that COR during the course of it. Um, so they, they could potentially add more land or, or if somebody came out, then they could do that as well. My question, Chad, is if we set these permit numbers based off the formula, which is based off of tag numbers that set in, say, April, does that stay for those three years regardless of what happens or how does that get changed in that cycle? Yeah, I think I think that's an important thing to, that I need to clarify. I don't think I hit this very good on my presentation as well. So as it currently sits, we're, we're honoring the three-year COR that, that is currently in place with, with all of them. Um, going forward, it would, it would delay a year on these limited entry ones. So the numbers that were, per, that were passed this year would be for not this fall, but the next fall. And the reason for that is, is a lot of these, a lot of landowners are trying to, to market these and just give them a little bit more time knowing what, how many tags or how many vouchers they're gonna get to market rather than having to turn it around faster was, was the rationale. And just to clarify there, so it remains a three year COR, but tag numbers change based off of last year, the previous year. Yeah, they'll, they'll change every year based off of the permits and, and the amount of acreage enrolled. And what happens to these once every three uh, tag, you know, LOAs where they don't qualify for a full permit? Yeah, and that's a good question. Uh, to, the determination that we made was if they qualify for one every three years, at least one, then we'll continue to do that. They'd get that permit the first year, the three year COR, um, and then move forward if if they didn't qualify for one over the course of the three years, then yeah, then we wouldn't accept that. I got a few more, sorry. I'm trying to understand this. I'll, I'll declare I do not own any land outside of the quarter acre that I have my house on. So dang it, but um, vouchers and permits, they still have to take this um, say general season or the LOA and actually redeem it for a hunting permit. Is it same if you're a non-resident landowner versus a resident landowner and the same cost at, respectively with what the division charges? I would have to wish Lindy was here. Um, I would think that it would be if you're a resident, it'd be the resident price. And if you're a non-resident, then it would be the non-resident price. But Th that's correct, Chad. Okay. So there's nothing that restricts a non-resident landowner from getting, a, say, a general season buck deer permit. If, if he's eligible, he's equal to a resident landowner. Is that accurate? Correct, yeah. And on the public access on LOAs, do they get entire season access? Is that how it's written? Yeah. And is that totally different than how a CWMU public access is written? Yeah, CWMU public access is they've, for bucks and bulls, and they're guaranteed five consecutive days. Um, it's it's a little bit different because CWMUs have a sixty day window to hunt in, right? So they have a really long season. So that, yeah, they get five consecutive days during that time period. So follow up with that: if we draw a multi season tag, and I'm first out of the hat, and I get public access, can I hunt all weapon seasons? Yeah, the, we're we're excluding multi season on this, and and so to clarify too, like we're we'll try to divide those tags up so um, they're not all just going to go to the rifle hunt, um, especially especially on these that have a lot of vouchers. We didn't want to overcrowd them, so we'd have we'd have like the first ones they they did be distributed equally throughout those seasons. I guess is the best way to to put that. I think I got one last quick one, Chad. Um, when would these rules go into effect? Would it be January 1st next year? Because it's a rule change? Yeah, so, well, the rule would go into effect, I guess, as soon if the board passes it, but it, it would be for the next renewal. So all but one of the LOAs renews next summer. So they would all, at that point, be playing under the new rules. 
uh, as far as the general season goes too, it wouldn't be for this fall, it would be for, for next fall. So the, the 2023 hunting season is the first time any of this would go into effect. And really for, for the limited entry side, it, their first hunting season would be 2024, their application in 2023. So, okay, I, I'm just trying to understand when an LOA would know that the formula has been calculated and here's your permits. That when do those permit numbers come up for them to know? So that would be as soon as, well, let me think about this and <laughs> make, sure make sure I say it clearly. So right now we would know for next year. So they, they would, we could calculate that as soon as the big game permits are, are passed in the spring for the for the following fall does that make sense go ahead Craig uh, how many LOAs in the state are there uh, there's it, it depends on how you count them but there's 21 but some of those are like the Ponsagant has a deer and an elk Diamond Mountain has deer and elk Book Cliffs has deer elk pronghorn so if you count those as one or well, I, that's counting them as separate. So that's got so 21, 21 counting them as separate. Yeah. So that there's not not a lot of them then. Yeah, not not a ton. Okay. And then what's the average acreage? Do you got any idea? Yeah, that that goes back to what he was asking, and it there's just such a range here. I mean, you look at a lot of them are in the 20s and 30s or 40s, but it. it that can depend so much on how, what the makeup of the unit is. If the unit is next to no private land, then it doesn't take a lot of private land to get your 50%. So mm. it can be very few acres, or, or if, if it has a lot of private land on it, then, then those are generally quite a bit more. Okay, and I guess the other question is, uh, on these LOAs, uh, I mean, like by farm ground, that's where they're going to be because that's where the best forage is you know it's not going to be out in the brush where they spend the day it's going to be in the fields at night how the LOAs how you know is it the prime place where they're where they're going to be the animals the LOA yeah so, on the LOAs yeah compared to the ground around them yeah so so I hope I hope I understand your question right but um it has to be in that species habitat to be included in the LOA. Right. 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 I guess is it the LOA the prime ground for the for habitat compared to the area next to it? I guess you know. So the, the question is: so if, Will will farm ground be? Is it included in habitat? Yeah, in farm. Yeah. So farm farm ground can be included in that. It, it's just. Um, yeah, if it's most farm ground, I'd say is in our habitat layers. Why did Chuck? So I wasn't I wasn't completely sure about how um, access changes. Is, is access changing between the the current rule and the proposed rule? How you allow access or who you allow access to? Yeah, yeah, it has. So so probably the biggest change is would be the variance that there wouldn't be a variance to not allow public access anymore. Um, in the past, it was a one-to-one -one access is what we're, we're asking. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't um, assigned, I guess, it, for lack of a better word. It was if people came. So we'd, we'd get people that would say that they could never get a hold of anybody or they didn't get access. Um, Sometimes we'd have people say it was only friends and family that got the access. So with the proposed rule, it would be the, the highest ranking in the draw would just get assigned that. And so if, if you drew and you, you were one of those highest ones that qualified for it, we would contact you and say, you, you're one, you have access to these private lands. Now it's up to them whether they hunt those private lands or not. You know, there's a, a decent chance that they're, scouted that limited entry unit for quite some time and know where they want to hunt beforehand. So, Kevin. 
Yeah. So Chuck, maybe the biggest change there is that one-to-one -one rule is always in there. We had no way to track whether it was actually happening or not. Now there's a mechanism in there to ensure that that's actually happening. Bart, go ahead. So by not giving the landowners choice or in who can hunt on their land, do you think that may impact Landowners Association participation in the program? It, it could, I guess that would be up to the landowners. Um, we have a pretty good track record with CWMUs um, where there's a list of rules that they can, that, that the people who are accessing have to abide by. Um, this year we'll have 1500 CWMU people, the CWMU public draw tags so that's probably about what we get every year. And we really haven't had issues in almost 30 years of CWMUs of, of abuse to the point where, where CWMUs are coming to us and saying, we, we can't tolerate this, so. So, I mean, it seems that, so you want, you're doing this for fairness and public access, but we want you know, private landowners to participate. And so kind of forcing their hand to participate in this way doesn't seem right to me. Yeah, so so there's there's two sides. I understand that side. I mean, my- and That's more a comment, I'm sorry, than a question. Yeah, I'll, I'll address it anyway. I mean, as I said in the video, my my family's part of the Ponsagon LOA, and I, I understand that part where it's, it's difficult to, you wanna protect your private land, right? Um, but at the same time, we get pushed from the other side. So that, that's one perspective is the landowner perspective of, of wanting to protect that. But you also get a perspective from the other side that you get a sportsman that draws out for a tag and says, okay, there's all these landowners that are getting this benefit, but I don't have access to any of their land. Um, and so, so I guess you can flip that around the same time. And um, if you watched the Northern Region Rack, that kind of came out of there of like, well, I don't know what the benefit for the public is. And so really that's what we're trying to accomplish with this whole rule is we find landowners are very valuable to wildlife. We, we acknowledge that, like they provide a lot. Um, the, the wildlife is a public resource. It is a public resource, but now if you're, if the initial scope of the program was to help reduce kind of the demand on your depredation, your officers to do depredation permits. Now you're just gonna go back to that, especially if people don't want random, you know, public on their land. They don't have a choice. Well, Have you thought of that? I mean, doesn't that, it, yeah, it seems okay. like you're expanding the scope of the program. No, I, I feel like we're more putting, bringing it into line with all our other programs. Um, that's, that's the one thing for, for sportsmen's is that they, they want access. If we're, if they're giving up vouchers and these vouchers, they're good for the whole entire unit, right? So if you get a, if the private landowner gets a voucher, they can hunt the public land. So all this is, is making it equal. If they can hunt the private land or the public land, then there should be some people that can hunt that private land as well. And probably on a one-to-one -one basis is what that rationale is. Um, if this, this would probably be a different conversation if, if the LOAs were staying on the private lands, right? Um, and that's option number two is an 80-20 split where we're not asking for near as much um, public access when it stays on completely on the private land. Thanks. Go ahead, question. On the CWMU, do they have to stay on the, the private land when they draw uh, buy a tag there? They have to stay in the CWMU, yeah. There's some CWMUs technically that have some public land in them, but yeah, they have to stay in the, the CWMU boundaries. Go ahead. I'll ask one more. Um, looking into the formula calculation, I know there's some heartburn over how that is working. Um, was it looked at like other states around us 
in the committee, maybe how they do it based off of usage counts versus just acreage. I mean, I'm familiar with a few of the states and I know like Nevada close by has a count plus a percentage override, but was that looked at in the committees when the formula was determined? Yeah, yeah, we, we discussed a lot of different things there and really what it boiled down to is the most objective way to do it and take the subjectivity out of it uh, without allocating our resources disproportionately to other places was to do the acreage calculation. Yeah, Austin, the, the Nevada model, the Nevada model specifically was one of the options that was looked at very closely. I have a couple of questions. Um, in the presentation and in the other racks, it was kind of suggested that the rules could be similar or established similar to the CWMUs. Um, but I don't believe we've established those or at least outlined them as clearly. And I think that's one of the big concerns is it's said, but it's not in writing. Am I correct that we haven't really set that up? Because if you go to the CWMUs, you can clearly find where it's written down and subsections of everything. So, yeah, we, we didn't put that in the rule, but even with the CWMU, a lot of that stuff isn't in the rule. Like, I don't think there's anywhere in the, in that, in the CWMU rule that talks about how much, how many guests you can have or whether you can drive your ATV. Um, so it would be, it'd be really handled similarly. Um, we would have those set of guidelines that would go through the rack and board process. Um, probably would mirror pretty closely to what the CWMUs is that you see on that. Well, and I guess that's what website. that's what I've heard suggested, and I heard the idea is that it would mirror very close, but I I just don't think it's been written down or part of the rule yet. Yeah. Okay. It's not. the The second question is in the CWMU program. Uh, there's committees that are formed to deal with uh, complaints and problems. Is that set up for this program? That was talked about at great length, and it was decided to that we wouldn't do that. And I think the reason being is, is that there's 132 CWMUs, and like I said earlier, 21 LOAs. I think as a division, we can monitor that and deal with with any complaints that arise. Okay. That's all I've got right now. We may have more in a minute. Anybody else? Right, well. I do have a question. Go ahead. Uh, just back, kind of back to the formula. Um, my understanding is that part of the idea, I know, and, and again, I appreciate all that you've done. I know you've, it's not always easy setting up there. Um, a, a lot of the kickback that I've heard from the sportsman side is, man, we don't feel like we had good representation. Um, you've already addressed that a little bit. You feel like you did. Um, it was by, the selection was by appointment, correct? Not by committee, but more by the selection of the committee was, for example, I'm I'm on the nominating committee for the wildlife board. We get together, then it's so it's committee and then appointment. Who who selected the individuals for representation? Yeah, we did as as the division. Okay. Um, also on on the formula uh, for this, you've mentioned several times. This is for 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 the general season. Is that the same formula now for the limited entry as well, or some of that grandfathered in? Yeah, so back to the way it was before. So yeah, let's let's clarify that a little bit. So general season are additive permits, and it's three percent above and beyond what the draw is. Um, LOAs those those vouchers are taking taken out of the public draw. So if we had fifty vouchers or if we had 50 permits on a limited entry unit and an LOA qualified for five, when the when the public draw came out, it would be 45. So, so it's a different mechanism, but also the percentage that that LOA get would depend on the amount of acres that they have in that species habitat. So if they have 
three percent of the the acreage in that species habitat, or or ten percent of the species habitat, then they'd get ten percent of those tags. Thank you. And again, just just for clarification, this is kind of a general clarification. The whole idea of this from the beginning was to provide some consistency from one end of the state to the other end of the state in how we do this whole thing, correct? Yeah, yeah, Thank we're you. we're really striving for consistency. Um, everybody playing by the, the same rules. Thank you. Go ahead, Gene. On this landowner draw, if the landowner qualifies for five tags, is he drawed once and gets all five tags, or has he got five uh, five tickets in the draw? Yeah, five tickets in the draw. So, so he might draw three. Yeah. yeah. Just to clarify, Riley, on your previous comment on how the committee was put together, the way this one was put together is the same for every committee that we do. The elk committee that's currently meeting, every mule deer, every plan that that's come across to this rack. That those committees have been put together the same way this committee was, so we're not we weren't doing anything different than what we've what we've always done. So, I have a question on that, Kevin. It it looks like, and, and maybe this is the same, but it looks like on this committee there was a larger percentage of landowners, and on the elk committee, it seems like we try to really split that among all interested party. Um, a, a more even split, but on this one, it appears to me that it's heavily on the landowners. I, I think if you looked at, you know, the way Chad had them, he was just indicating that that a lot of them were landowners. They weren't necessarily representing landowners. Like, like uh, for instance, I think John Hart has said landowner though, didn't? Well, on the far right side, he indicated who was landowners. But like John Bear, John Bear was on the committee. He's also a landowner, so we said we we issued that he was a landowner, but he was there representing sportsmen. So that that um, okay. that table that we that we showed may be a little bit misleading that okay. way because people like John, they are landowners, but he was there representing sportsmen. I think he's there trying to get a tag, but knowing Always. John as I do. <laughs> and, and just to touch on that, yeah, it was we try to split it down the middle of sportsmen's thoughts and and landowner thoughts. Thank you. I, I, that's good clarification. Gene, were you reaching a minute ago? Did you have another question? Oh, I thought you saw. Oh, okay. Down on the end. Thank you, Nick. Nick. I knew someone down there was reaching. Yeah. I don't know whether this happens or not, but let's say that somebody drew a voucher or, you know, got a tag on the draw. They went to use it and they had issues that they couldn't solve between the landowner and the hunter. And so the hunter isn't allowed on the property for some reason. Is there any way that DWR would be able to compensate for that and help this person that drew out and even if he couldn't get on the LOA? Uh, so I guess I guess the way this, this is written is that they would, like if they're one that got the public access, then they would they would have that access. So if there if an issue arose between landowners and a specific hunter for a reason, then we would have that conversation with the landowner and with the hunter um, and see if we could resolve that. Um, but but yeah, otherwise, like if it's something that wasn't resolvable, then that's the question. Yeah, if if it was something where we felt like that landowner probably shouldn't have to take them on, I would think that we would say you're yeah you're out of yeah, luck <laughs> yeah so yeah we would still want to protect landowners for sure yeah yeah so so nick and that there's that protections built in where the landowners association would develop a set of rules and if the hunter didn't follow the rules that they set then it's hard for us to come to go to bat for him right and and the both the the private hunters and the public hunters would know what those rules were up front and they would be they would be developed by each individual landowner association. So kind of the expectations would be known. So let's let's say, and I don't think I'm not saying this is happening. Let's say the problem was with the landowner; he wasn't following what he agreed to. How would you compensate this particular person that drew a tag? So, yeah, I mean they they still have the whole entire unit to hunt, so they should still be able to have a good okay. hunt. Otherwise. Okay. 
And, and if there's bad actors that are on the landowners, as much as I just said, we want to protect landowners, we also want to protect our sportsmen. If, there, if we have bad actors on landowners, then we'd potentially be looking at them not being able to be part of the LOA if they're not abiding by that set of rules. So hold that set standard to hunters and to, to landowners. I may have missed it, but how many of the committee members were part of an LOA? LOA? So three. Three of um, them. Yeah, two, two that were presidents and one that was a landowner. I'm ready to go to the questions from the public. Are you good? All right. Uh, we'll go to questions from the public again. As you stand to ask your questions, please state your name and who you represent. Questions. I thought I was done with questions. I forgot that we still only did, we only did half of the room. <laughs> I'm glad I brought my water. Mike, you're earning your money tonight. Yeah. All right, I better say it again since the mic wasn't on. I'm Whitney Hewlett Krogh. I represent the Diamond Mountain Landowners Association. Um, you mentioned earlier on this committee that there were some uh, landowners association presidents on. But I think you also said that the vote. I flipped the switch. It looks like it came on again. Maybe. Can we vote to give them a new budget for equipment. All right, so earlier there was a question about this vote of the committee and you said that everyone who was there on the last night voted for these rules, but does that um, kind of presume that some people weren't there? Yeah, I, I honestly couldn't tell you if everybody was, I know not everybody was there, but I don't know how many were missing that night. Okay. Do you know whether uh, both of the landowners association presidents were there? No, Dave wasn't there. Do you know if the other one Chris was? was yeah. Okay. Um, we talked a little about these rules that the landowners association could come up with some rules and then, you know, hope that the that the hunters that the state gave permission to be on the private land would follow these rules. Uh, my question is about enforcement. So say, for instance, these rules like the landowner association said, all right, a hunter can come on with three guests but a hunter shows up with five guests. So under these new rules, it was the state that gave these people permission to be on the private land in the first place. So could the private landowner, if they're breaking the rules, like do they have the ability to take away that permission and tell them to leave? Yeah, and I, I would just contend a little bit there that it, the state's not given permission to landowner associations by participating in the program or, or giving permission. Mm -hmm. But but in answer, yes. Um, they if they're breaking any of those those rules, yeah, we would support that they no longer hunt on that place. And I'm sorry if I to put words in your mouth about the uh, permission thing, okay. but in under the new rules, the state is choosing who gets to come on the land through the draw and through the numbers, right? Correct. Okay. So and and um but this idea that the landowners could then kick people off of their land if they're not following the, the rules. Uh, that's not in the rules, in the new rules, is it? It doesn't expressly state that, no. 
Okay. So the um, the enforcement mechanism about um, it. So this idea of the if the private hunter brings on you know five guests and the rules say three. Does the state need to be involved in enforcing that rule, or does like how does the private landowner go about enforcing enforcing the rules against these hunters? I think it could go a lot of different ways, but um, I think as a state we would want to know for sure um, if if an LOA landowner asked a hunter to leave under those circumstances, we'd be fine with that. Like I don't think that they have to wait for us to come and to ask them to leave, but we for sure want to track that so we know if it's working if, and if we need to make any adjustments. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you mentioned at some of the other racks, there was this question about whether the landowners were providing a benefit to the wildlife. Um, is, is the DWR's position that the landowners are providing a benefit to um, to these herds and, and to the program as a whole? Yes, like we, we value our relationships with landowners. Uh, we have a lot of good landowner associations, uh, CWMUs, all those that participate us, with us in any of our landowner programs, we, we feel like there's a good mutual benefit. Um, that's the reason why we do these programs. If we felt like there wasn't any value, then then I'd be standing up here saying, let's get rid of the rule, not, not just make adjustments to it. All right, thank you. Any other questions from the public? Go ahead and just stand up. I'm Andy Monroe. I'm representing the Oak Creek Landowner Association. I'm the president. I I just have a few questions for you. Um, one of which is uh, on the on the committee. Were those landowner that were on the committee, did they represent themselves or were they representing all landowner associations in the state? I believe that they were, we, we asked them to represent the landowners in the state is what we did. Were any of, were the rest of the landowner associations in the state notified that this was in taking place so that they could put their input into these representatives that were on that committee? Yeah, like, like I stated earlier, we did ask the, everybody, not just landowner associations, but everybody that represented a group that they reach out to their constituents. So I, I can't verify whether that, how so much I guess, that So I guess my not. point to that question would be, I am a landowner association president. I represent 34,000 acres on the Oak Creek. I never knew that this was even going place or taking place and never would have known anything of it had some of these people that seen this coming notified a bunch of landowner associations presidents. There's several that that had no idea this was coming down the pipe. So how, how if so if this process would have taken place, the rest of the landowner associations had not been um, you know, told about it, when would they have been notified of the rules changes that they were expected to live by? Yeah, so that I mean like like I said, we we asked them to to reach out to you guys and Maybe this is a good point, a, a good time to to trump one other real part of the rule change, which is that there's a required president's training annually. Um, I know I've talked to other LOA people that have said that they've tried in the past to to get landowner associations together without a lot of success. So. Um, yeah, I, I think that that will be an important part going forward is that it will connect us with the landowner associations, but also connect landowner associations with each other as well. Because um, this this is the public process and, and it is, I mean, you, we're, we're talking about landowners right now, but you can say the same for sportsmen. There, how many sportsmen that would be completely opposed to this don't know what's going on. And, and that it's probably a similar number. So it is it is the public process. I guess there is some ownership for anybody who wants to follow any changes to follow this process, that there's racks and boards to, to pay attention to what's going on around them. But yeah, I mean, ultimately, I guess if, if you didn't see any of that, then it would be 
when your new COR application came up, then at right. that, so that we point would just time. be expected to live by it without having any type of input at all. And that I don't think that's right. That's it's not a representation of the, the LOAs as a whole. Um, all the when you when you don't have any kind of input into a, a change like that, that's going to directly affect you. You know, you, you, I mean, I, I understand you're saying that the public hunter is also being affected. It is, but not like a, a private landowner that is directly tied to private land. Is that a question? We're going to get to that's, comments in that's a minute. A, that's a, more of a comment. I apologize. Okay. <laughs> I'll get to my next question. So when we, our, our uh, landowner association is fairly new. This will only be our seventh year in as the Oak Creek, when we, when they changed the boundaries and took in and took in all the private land, because before they changed the brown boundaries, there was no private land in the Oak Creek. The division proposed to change, change the boundaries to take in all this private land that's around the unit that surrounds it. So at that point, we were required as landowners to get on board with the biologist. Riley Peck is the biologist that came to our meeting. He told us in that meeting that we would be required basically the one-to-one -one deal that you're talking about. Anybody that is eligible for one tag would be required to have one hunter, um, public hunter access their property. So everybody that was in the LOA agreed to that. There was some that didn't agree to it and so they didn't join. But everybody agreed to that. Um, in our there's there's seven tags given to the to our LOA, all of which are auctioned. So each, I mean, up until now, everybody's been required to have one public hunter, even though there's nobody in our unit that actually would qualify for one tag as a private landowner, because there's so many acres in it and so few tags. How so. Many acres in that there's 34,000 approximately private acres in it. So now we're going to require the same guy that has 640 acres, which is our minimum to get in to our association. We're going to require them to have seven public hunters, as well as the guy that has 4,000 acres. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's a bit yeah. of a discrepancy as far as what's going to be required and acreage wise. Yeah. And I think one of the things that we do for the division on that is it's really hard for us to get in the weeds in every single aspect. Um, but as, as an LOA, you have the ability to write your, your bylaws. And even though you have to allow access, uh, it would be in your purview that you could, you could address it in there. So if the guy with 4,000 acres is getting all the access, maybe in your bylaws, you, you say you, you write compensation towards, um, who's, who's allowing the access or, like, like we really allow you guys to to figure that part of it out, but but, but each landowner will be required to have the number of public hunters that there is the number of landowner tags. Yes. So to be clear, that's the max. Um, like, like I was stating earlier, hunters do a pretty good job of distri distributing themselves right. across the landscape, um, and also a lot of them. They, they might have their, their public spot that they've been watching for a long time, and they, they may not even reach out to the landowner association. Right. Yeah, and I understand that. I'm, I'm just kind of giving you some, sure. you know, if this was to take place. So these hunters that are notified that they have access to all private lands within that unit that are in the landowner association, who then will be liable for those hunters? on the private land as far as who's who's going to take the liability let's say um a hunter wrecks his four-wheeler on private property who who is going to be liable for that so so if it's any criminal thing like if then then that we would look at that criminally right? no but i'm talking about so so if a hunter that has a tag it's the public hunter he comes onto somebody's private property and crashes his four wheeler and gets hurt. Oh, yeah. Who, so where's that liability? The, the landowners are not liable for that. So that's in code. Like uh, Kyle's online; he can walk walk us through that. Of you, you have no liability on that. Okay, Kyle, would you take a minute and just talk about the the liability protections that are in state code? Sure. So the question is whether the draw hunters who are given access to the 
uh, private lands on the LOA create liability, right? So under the landowner liability statute, the LOAs would be protected from the public hunters who are given access to the property uh, on that code alone. Uh, there's been some discussion in previous racks about how Title 23 has a specific exemption for CWMUs. Um, but as far as the public hunters go, their landowner liability statute itself covers the access as long as there's not uh, more than a dollar fee charged for that access. S so that means that we need to charge for that access or zero? No, zero. You're, yeah. All right. you, owe, you do not owe a duty to someone you just allow on your property um, to notify them of, of risks, uh, of um, potential dangers there. But if you do charge, then there's a potential um, duty of care there for the landowner. OK. All right, thank you. My name is Rachel Anderson. I guess I represent sportsmen and ranching. Um, has the DWR been holding annual meetings with the LOAs? Not currently. That's that's one of the new proposals of this. The, the proposal of this uh, rule is that it would be required going forward. We did that with CWMUs. We have an operator annual operator training, and it really helped a lot. For, for both the CWMU and the DWR. So we'd like to see that implemented. Thank you. Troy Justinson, Sports and Fish and Wildlife. My question is, would the division consider bringing back the committee for one last meeting to listen to all the input we've heard all over the state to make sure they got it right? Or if, hey, we need to tweak this. Yeah, so so we've, we've talked about this so the last little bit here. And at this point, we have a committee, a committee's formed. That committee helps the division form a recommendation. And at this point, this is our recommendation. Okay, you stated that there's what, 21 LOAs? Yeah. And then what is there, 200 and some odd uh, permits for landowners? Mm -hmm. And you stated earlier that you could, you know, if there's a something happened that uh, disgruntled, you could handle that 200. How come we didn't reach out to 21 presidents just to say, hey, FYI, there's change coming? Yeah, and I, I think I think the ball got dropped there by quite a few people. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I mean, looking back, maybe that's what we should have done. And there's nothing wrong with being wrong or making a mistake. It, it just man up in a minute. So, yeah. Uh, Gary Gardner with the Indian Peaks Landowner Association. I guess my uh, question is, as uh, we have certain equipment and things out on some of these uh, private lands, and if damage is caused by the hunters, who's going to be responsible for that? Once again, the state's going to mandate. Yeah, so once again, I'd say, you know, that that to me would sound like a criminal charge that they could be charged criminally for. Um, and I think if you look at the the division, we, our stance is we were opposed to criminal activity. So we would be very supportive of of those charges coming forward. And, and will there be any, uh, can we put some restrictions? I mean, I mean, we've got some areas that have old mine shafts uh, on the private. So there, there is some extra liability there. I mean, and then you have fuel tanks. If somebody happened to shoot a hole in them, that would create a big environmental problem. So oh, that, that's a really good question. And, and I'll, it seems like we, it's kind of funny because a lot of times I come to these meetings presenting CWMU stuff and I feel like I'm like getting, beat up over CWMU and now I'm referring to the CWMUs and uh, of all the positive things that come out of them. But in the CWMUs, I, we would do it similar to that as far as 
you can have places where you can say, okay, th this is off limits, but it just needs to be equal for both. So if it's off limits for the public hunter, then it needs to be off limits for the, the guy that bought the tag as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm Gibby Yardley from Beaver, and I'm representing the Panguis Lake Private Hunting Unit. Uh, Mike Tibbs from Panguis is the president of the Panguis Lake Hunting Unit. He told me that he was never notified about this meeting or most of these other meetings. How come not? All these presidents should be on that. And he, he didn't know a thing about this meeting until I called him and told him. I don't think that you DWR people are notifying the people of this state and the people of these regions with the information that we need to draw permanent conclusions about these hunts and everything else. They're at the Cedar City unit. At that Cedar City meeting, you didn't have any data there telling about the number of elk antelope and other things that were on these units and the number that were going to be taken off. You people have got to get more information to us people that have got these problems and it's not happening. Gib, are you going to do a question? We're going to do comments here in just a minute. Is okay. That's a question? You, you started with a question. Do you want to end with a question? No, I'll make comments later then if I can't do it now. You sure can. Did you fill out a card? Yeah, I think we got one from you. We'll call you up in just a minute. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions from the public? All right, let's summarize the online feedback we got and then we'll go to comments from the public. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Well maybe surprising considering the amount of attention that we've got here in the meeting tonight, there was only four people that commented online um, on this. Um, one or, and is essentially split 50, 50, um, two that, that agreed and two that didn't um, comments were similar to what we heard tonight. There was a, a, an online comment submitted by the diamond mountain landowners association that, that was very um, detailed and um, in, in the reasons that they're concerned about the, the rule, and then some comments from the public side that were very um, complimentary to, to making public access part of the rule and, and making sure that that happened. So it was, it was split 50 50. Um, I was a little surprised there was only four people that commented though. Thank you. So again, as comments from the public, uh, if you're representing yourself, you have three minutes. If you're representing an organization, you have five. Uh, do the amount of comments and just the nature of this, I am going to limit you to the time. So I'll be watching the time uh, and give you a, a warning. Uh, we'll go ahead and start with Whitney Krogh. Thanks. So again, I'm Whitney Hewlett Krogh. I represent the Diamond Mountain Landowners Association. Um, we've talked a little bit earlier about the collaboration between the landowners and, and the DWR in in managing these herds. So the previous or the, the current rule, it talks about how the purpose of these vouchers is to compensate the landowners for the lost forage that, that these herds are, are eating off of their land. So Diamond Mountain, it, um, it's 35% of the total unit acreage. Um, but the, you know, the people who live there who are watching these herds, what they're saying is the, the herds come and they eat on the private land because that's where you know, the lush forage is, and then they go and sleep on the public land. So as far as hunting goes, the, the hunting is still good on the public land, but the place that's getting hit the hardest by these herds, that's the private land. And I'm told that it's uh, three elk AMUs for, the, uh, for every cow. So, and these herds are, are, are large, like these are, these are trophy herds. They have a lot of, a lot of elk, a lot of deer. And that is like, that's causing a big, 
um, depredation on these on these private lands. And under the depredation statutes, there's no way to get money from the state for that that forage that the elk that the state the state's animals are eating. So these vouchers have been a way for the landowners to get compensated for all the forage that they're losing. And um, I think that there's there's a misconception maybe among the sportsmen or maybe people who don't understand maybe how much these animals eat, that the landowners are getting rich off of these vouchers. But really all of that, or at least the vast majority of that money is going back into the land. So these landowners are doing range management programs where they're, you know, they're clearing out the sagebrush that you like we can't really do on public land. Um, they're creating and improving water sources and doing a lot of things that benefit the, the animals themselves. And they're really a big part of why these herds have been so successful. Um, one other thing that, uh, that I know Diamond Mountain does is they do a lot of predator control uh, efforts that they hire, you know, they pay to hire a coyote plane that goes out and shoots some coyotes. And, and on top of all of that, on top of all the work they're doing on their own land to try to make it so that they can support the wildlife and their own livestock, uh, the Diamond Mountain Landowners Association has spent over $150,000 on range improvement on public land that they're putting back into the public land to try to encourage more of the animals to move onto the public land. So. This is, this is a collaboration that's been going on between the DWR and the landowners to make this range better for everybody. Um, the rule changes, they are reducing the number of landowner permits and they're imposing a whole new set of restrictions on the landowners who have been providing this, this forage for these animals. Uh, the biggest problem I know we've talked a lot about is the access problem because um, previously, the landowners themselves could choose which, uh, which private hunters came onto their land. So it was the landowners themselves that gave permission to the public hunters. But here, I thought that was my five minutes already, all right. Uh, but here under these rule changes, it, the state is deciding which hunters get to come on. And it's, you know, it's a luck of the draw thing. And I, I get the, the fairness aspect of that. But the problem is, is when a hunter has to go to a landowner and ask permission, that creates some accountability. And um, I know Diamond Mountain in particular has had quite a lot of problems with public hunters in the past. The last year before the LOA was formed, they lost 26 cows to public hunters. And, you know, the reality is that the the DWR and uh, and I know that the law enforcement they're doing their best to find this, but a lot of times you you can't track down who did that, and and it's even more difficult to get somebody to pay for that. So they lost. Uh, I always forget the horse. Twenty six cows and one horse that was shot that year. Um, and I know there's this idea that there are some. Uh, that, you know, they can issue some rules and regulations, but we're just not seeing a way to enforce that. Um, there's nothing in the rule saying what landowners can and can't do, and these hunters will have a permit from the state saying they have a right to be there. So how is a private landowner going to say, no, like, you have to go, you have to leave? Um, so and we've submitted, like, a, a very long letter with some legal problems that we see also with the rule. Um, but I'm not going to bore you with that. That's on the record and in the letter if you'd like to read it. So, thanks. Thank you. Appreciate it. We have Dave uh, Shivers, I believe. And then after that, Andy Monroe. I'm Dave Shivers. Um, I'm the Diamond Mountain Landowners President. Um, we've had a great working relationship with the division for about 30 years. Um, originally, when we set this up, we had 35% of the private property, so we got 35% of the permits. And uh, that was supposed to be our compensation for um, feeding and watering um, the livestock on our private property. Since we have been a landowner's unit, we have not asked the division for one load of water, one roll of bob wire, or any other kind of compensation since we've been a unit. We've taken care of that ourselves. Um, a lot say that we're against public access. We've had the variance, probably the only one in the state that was applying and getting the variance because we wanted to choose 
who hunted our private property. In 2012, we was keeping track up until 2012, and we still have them, hundreds of documents signed by the landowner and by the public hunter that was allowed access. Um, Boyd Blackwell, our um, regional leader at that time, told us that that wasn't required by law and that we didn't need to do it anymore. So at that time, we kept quit keeping them records. It's not that we're against public access. Um, it's, it's, it's our property. The permits are supposed to be compensation for um, what we provide for the wildlife. I'm the fourth largest landowner on the mountain and I own 5,000 acres of private property. I'll, I hauled $47,000 worth of water last year. I got $15,000 out of my permits. We can all argue how much the cows drink and how much did the elk drink. Um, along with everything else that goes um, along with it, um, the landowners, there's 156 of us. Um, we love the animals. We want them to stay there. We don't want to go back to a general season unit. Um, cabins being broke in and animals being killed and fences cut. With that being said, the, our landowner board has already met. And if we're forced by the division to allow public access to who they decide, we're gonna dissolve. Who's gonna lose? The landowners, the public, and definitely the wildlife. Thank you. All right, Andy Monroe, followed by Robert Hawk. Yeah, Andy Monroe, um, representing Oak Creek Landowner Association. Um, I too just would uh, kind of echo some of Dave's comments that, that he made there. Um, you know, there's there's landowners on our um, that are located on our unit that are hauling water already this year. They were hauling water last year on public and private ground. Um, and we can argue what drinks more or, or less, but there's some of each that are getting that are drinking. Um, I I said before in my questions, you know, I, I, I really feel like if the if there was an opportunity for all landowner association presidents and members of those landowner associations to because as a president, I have 20 some odd people that are in our landowner association. So I need to visit with them on their feelings on this kind of stuff. We didn't know nothing about this till two weeks ago. So if we would have the opportunity to collect that, you know, input from them and then give our input, whether we sit on the committee or not, at least our voice is being heard. Um, and I think that would have gone a, a long ways um, towards having this received a little bit better by the, the landowner associations. Um, this, it, this rule would not take effect until 2024, I believe. Was that right? I we feel like we have time to revisit this one more time and at least get input from the people that were not allowed to get input because they didn't know nothing about it <clears throat> and they don't feel like they had representation. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Robert Ott, followed by Gib Yardley. Thank you. Uh, I represent the Ponsagant Landowners Association, <clears throat> and I have written comments. Who would I give those to, as well as my verbal? Thank you. So this letter is uh, from the Ponsagant Landowner Wildlife Association, the PLWA, dated May 16th, 2022, to Utah's RACS and the Wildlife Board. Opposition to proposed LA rule changes of rule R657-43. Current RAC members, thank you for the opportunity to present the concerns of the PLWA with respect to the proposed rule changes governing landowner associations in the state. The PLWA was formed in the early 1990s to represent landowners in the Pontagon unit. It has been in continuous operation since that time and has provided a continuing positive relationship to the condition of the deer herd on the Pontagon unit, the public and the local economies of the area. 
Currently, we have over 90 members and over 48,000 acres of privately owned excellent deer habitat in FAA status represented by our LOA. We allow a minimum of five acres of mechanically harvested alfalfa and 160 acres of qualified rangeland to qualify for membership in our association. The basis for allocation in our association is 640 rangeland acres is equal to 20 acres of mechanically harvested <clears throat> alfalfa. And these constitute one unit. We do not allow lands in the unit to be leased for the purposes of obtaining membership in the LOA. Each year members must apply for membership and verification of habitat and ownership of qualifying lands. The vouchers we receive each year are currently auctioned by Sportsman for Fish and Wildlife, and they receive 10% of the sales for wildlife projects. For years, the PLWA has provided extra funding for predator control on the Ponsagant unit and has hauled water for the deer on the winter range when recommended by the DWR biologist for the unit. Landowners provide water development and rangeland improvements on private lands to facilitate improving the habitat for deer. In various locations, the LOA members have left the last cutting of hay to provide forage for the deer herd. Members are required to allow public hunters access to their lands that they have enrolled in the PLWA on a first come first served basis and in numbers as determined by the landowner to provide a reasonable hunting experience. Members are not allowed to seek additional wildlife cause economic loss or damages from DWR beyond the allocation they received from the PLWA. So here are the issues we have with the proposed rules. The first issue we take with the proposed rules is that the PLWA input to the, real form, to the rule formation was totally disregarded. DWR claims as follows. The DWR formed a diverse committee that met nine times over the course of a year to revise the landowner permit rule R657-43. The rule provides the standards and procedures for how we manage general season landowner buck deer permits and limited entry landowner association LOA vouchers for deer, elk, and pronghorn. Below is a summary of the proposed changes and other pertinent information in the rule. Robert, yes. you're less than a minute. I don't think at this rate you're going to make it through the document. You may want to summarize. Okay, my summary is that we did not receive any information that these rules were even being considered to be changed until about three weeks ago. We had no idea until we received information from another landowners association. That is hardly a collaborative uh, position with the DWR and our well-established LOA that's been there for that many years. We have other issues with allowing you people to decide who hunts on our property. We have issues with hunters and we have issues with uh, guides that we absolutely will not let on hunt on our property again. Thank you, Robert, you're out of time. Okay, and you have my written comments. So Appreciate thank it. you. Thank you. All right, Gib Yardley and then Gary Gardner. We've got 39,000 acres of private land in the Bangladesh Lake unit. Several years ago, they were giving us eight or nine tags. That was uh, bull elk tags. Now with the same acreage in the drought, they've cut us down to four. four tags for 39,000 acres. I've got a friend that's a guide up on the mini, uh, mini mall unit up by nine mile at price, 17,000 acres 
They give them 45 tags. We're, we're being cheated terrible with four tags for 39,000 acres. How are we going to raise that amount? Because it's not fair to us as landowners. At my ranch at AC Creek here five weeks ago, there was 40 head of elk and there wasn't a green spear grass there. 40 head of them right on my private land, grazing it all. Now, how are we going to get an increase in what we deserve to take off in this drought year off that Panguage Lake unit? We deserve a lot more than four because we're not being treated very fairly. Now, how are we going to increase that? Who's that up to? Who's, who's the one that's responsible for those numbers? Who determines that? If you're asking a question, Gib, this, yes, rule, I, this rule would determine that, the rule that's being discussed right now. And it, there's a formula in the rule. You mean this new rule that they're going to change? Well, we deserve a lot more permits than we're getting. And so I want you people to give us some serious consideration and increase that number abundantly. Four permits on 39,000 acres isn't anything, especially on a drought year. We ought to be taking four times more on a drought year. You people have got to consider how bad this drought is. Our cattle, we hold them off, held them off a month last year because the drought was doggone bad. We get up there on our permit on top of the Cedar Mountain. It looks like a herd of sheep's been up there. It's all grazed right off when we got there. We went up a month later. Seconds. So I'll tell you, you've got to take a lot more elk off of these ranges. 15, a year ago. Thank you, Gib, that's time. All five minutes. Let me say one more thing. <laughs> Gib, we, we really need to limit it. We gave five no, minutes. You, you don't limit some people, but you limit me. Some I've of these other people talk longer. I've, I've been doing it very fairly tonight, Gib. Well, some of them talk longer than five minutes. Gary Gardner, followed by Richie Anderson. I guess as I talked to some of my LOA members, uh, if if the rule changes and the state has uh, control over who goes on and things, then a lot of them talk like they will back out because the money isn't isn't worth all the the fences that get cut by the hunters and they kind of drive and go where they want. Uh, we, we do have a few places we don't want the hunters, but most of our land isn't posted or anything, and they there's plenty of it out there to be to go to. So, uh, and we've never restricted them, only in a, a spot or two. So, anyway, uh, that's my comment. Thank. Thank you, Richie Anderson, followed by Doyle Moss. Richie, are you representing yourself or a group? Mr. Chairman, if possible, could I be put towards the end of the comments? I'm waiting for a text on a potential conflict. Right. You're pretty close to the end, so you better okay. tell that text to speed up. Okay. We'll give you a we'll give you a break. Doyle, and then we'll go to Troy. Well, first off, I'd like to thank all the landowners. You guys have been amazing. I think everybody, I mean, this has kind of been like a marriage between the, the fishing game and the landowners. It's been awesome. But what happened is you come home and your neighbor tells you you're getting divorced. I mean, it's unbelievable that we couldn't send a simple email to 21 landowners that run these private landowners to say, hey, this is what's going on. Um, you know, everybody's just finding out two weeks ago. It's, uh, it's pretty sad, but it's been a great partnership. I will tell the division, you will lose a lot of landowners, what you're doing. If you guys pass this tonight, it's game over because it's you'll win three on these racks. And it's just pretty sad because it's been a great partnership. What the division doesn't know 
is there's been many logs. Um, Ponce gone. These other guys got up. Dave got up, and these guys have logged public hunters on their places. And we have helped many people on these ranches. We got them for free. We let them come on. We get our two people on every ranch we're supposed to. One thing about the Ponce Gaunt, everybody knows, Troy knows, you go down there in Johnson Canyon, um, November, October, there's 400 deer in the hay fields. Okay, what are you gonna do when all of those rifle hunters say, I want to hunt right there? It's gonna be a war. Um, it's just, it's really sad to me. A lot of great things um, talking about these, some of these landowner tags have been sold through conservation. They do great things. It's almost $1 million that's been raised for conservation by selling these landowner tags. Nobody probably knows that. It's going on the ground. These guys have been doing a great job. As you can see, guys, I'm really passionate about this. I love this state, but this is how easy it is. You hand a landowner a voucher or he's gonna sue you for the damages. It's that simple. And we don't want that. We just wanna hunt. There's a couple people that are sour. They can't hunt all the properties. All he's gonna do is take his property out of it anyway, and he's not gonna be able to hunt it anyway. So let's just keep working through it. Um, we're, we're comparing the Ponsgon and all these other landowners associations, 21 of them. They all should be separate, just like they all should be the biologists that say how many we should allow for the Landowner Association. You guys have bundled the entire state uh, as all in one and saying that everybody should be allocated this many landowner tags. So if it's hay or water or whatever, they should be different than the guy that just has bitter brush. You got 15 seconds. Anyway, just appreciate everything, guys. I hope this thing works because if it passes, I'm done. Troy, followed by Garrett Hall. Troy Justinson, Sports and Fishing Wildlife. Gene, you're in luck. I was in Johns Valley today and seen two rabbits. I ain't got a permit, so I'll tell you where they're at. You can go kill them. No. Serious. Now, before I get started, I just want to give a shout out. Uh, those of you that know Bryce Pilling, he's a member of our crew. He helps a lot of predators. Uh, I'd be feel bad if I didn't let everybody know that he suffered a heart attack last week. He's got a long road ahead of him. So those of you that are the praying type, it wouldn't hurt to offer a few prayers for Bryce. He's a great man and has done a lot for wildlife in this state. Now, I've never been more torn over an issue in 30 years of doing this as I am this. I've waffled back and forth, thinking, all right, this is the right way, you know, this is the wrong way. And I've struggled. I've had conversations with landowners. I've had conversations with the division. I've had conversations with board members. This is a tough one, but it's important. But one thing I think we really missed on, and I don't know, I'm just, I'm, what you see is what you get with me. I just call a spade a spade. The true value to these uh, permits is their public. I would dare say the high majority of these tags are hunted on public land. So at the end of the day, that's where they got to fall is to benefit the public. I'm not saying they don't got to benefit the landlords because they do. As I've gone through this and trying to, in my mind, figure out what the best way is, as I've talked to several landowners, they're upset with the number of permits they get or the money they get feel like their land is better. So I was all about, hey, we need a count and we need to put the money in the guy that's feeding the wildlife, that has the most on his land. There's a flaw to it. There's a flaw to everything. When it finally clicked to me, it, it boils down to this. If you're to do a count, it's gonna to err towards the landowner. With the current system the division has with doing uh, heat transfer or whatever they are, um, a wildlife migration to show habitat layers in the current system they have, it would err on the side of the public. The CWMU is set up to reward those guys that own, own large tracts of public ground. They get the majority of it, which they should. But because 
this is a public resource that I understand, trust me, I know better than anybody else the value of private land and what they do for our herds. But at the end of the day, this is fair. We have to have some sort of unity. And so I would support the division's recommendation with two caveats, one of which is we have a metric added to where we know if this is working for both landowners and uh, the general public, a metric to gauge it. It was mentioned here earlier, I mean, how many of you guys know in here, Robert's here, that they spent thousands of dollars on predator control last year. They spent thousands of dollars to haul water. They spent thousands of dollars to do habitat restoration. I think in those metrics, as we get together, we can present that to the public and they see there is a value that these guys aren't just pocketing money, they're investing back in the resource. So we need that metric. I would also support and, and plan B, whatever it is there, that you go to a Nevada style count. If you're hunting public, private ground, count what's on there, you figure a different metric. Please go back one time to the committee. I've sat on more committees than I guarantee you anybody in this room. We're telling everybody they have a voice, but they really don't. Verlin knows I sat on the Henry Mountain Bison Committee meeting. There's no hotter topic and seat than that one. We came up with a plan. Not all the producers were able to sit on there. We decided to meet with them and say, here's the plan before we go to the racks. We give them the opportunity to be heard. And then we got back as a committee and said, you know what? We're pretty comfortable where we land, go forward. That's all that has to happen here. Quite honestly, all the committees should be this way. That once they have the public input, I represent sportsmen, but I can't reach out to all my contingency. And there's people here that aren't members of group. This is what the RAC is for, is to gain that information. Let that committee get there one more time, say, you know what? I'm comfortable where we landed. Nope. We need to tweak this. Thank you. Thanks, Troy. Garrett Hall and then Richie Anderson. Thank you. I'm Garrett Hall here representing Utah Farm Bureau. Um, first off, we, we want to thank the division. Been good to work with. We we were part of the committee. I, I wasn't personally on the committee. My one of my colleagues, Whit Garrett, represent us on there. Um, we he was part of this, I know, for the nine or ten months or however long uh, they met. We, we need to remember the value of the, the private landowners. That private land is uh, it's irreplaceable when you're talking about raising wildlife. Uh, habitat and feed is just something you're not, you're not gonna get on the, on the private land or on the public land. Um, but having worked in, in good faith as an organization with the division, we're gonna support the division's recommendation. Um, we'd ask you to support that. We know it's not perfect. Um, I, I'm going to echo a couple of things that Troy just said. I, I would love to see some kind of a matrix to know how going forward is, is this working. I think that should be part of any any plan. Um, and also, uh, we, we would certainly support the opportunity to take this back to the committee and, and let them, uh, having heard the feedback that comes out of the rack, see if there's any of those ideas that need to be incorporated into the plan. So if, if that's a possibility, if that works, we would certainly support that. But uh, overall, we support the plan. We know it's it's a tough issue. It's hard to make everybody happy, but we think it's the best we have right now. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Richie Anderson, last comment card. So Richie Anderson, a rancher and a sportsman, I'll also be uh, speaking for Dan Crozier, president of the Utah Ken Cattlemen's Association as well. Uh, I'm in an interesting position tonight for sure. So I was contacted by three LOAs in my area and then the Northeast region uh, to look into this issue. Uh, I've had a little success in legislative and policy issues and kind of facilitating solutions. So they asked me to look into it. That's what I've done the last several weeks. Um, I was the individual that contacted many of these LOAs that had not been contacted, uh, that didn't know about it. Uh, I also facilitated the meeting we had a couple weeks ago with about half of the LOA groups. Um, they simply didn't know. Um, they wasn't in, informed. Um, so there's a, there's, we're fighting a, a perception that this landowner voucher program is a welfare program. Nothing could be further from the truth. This is a very good investment of the state of Utah for the state of Utah. 
Um, at one of the other racks, there was a comment that, well, the ranchers get funding for all of their habitat projects anyway, through NRCS or UGIP. We, we can get funding. Never is that funding 100%. The best I've ever seen funding to help us on these projects is 50%. I'll give you an example. Right now, I'm doing a project on state land, open public hunting land. Uh, it's a $32,000 water project. Uh, UGIP is going to fund 13000 of it. We're going to fund $19,000 out of pocket. Our cattle will use that water system for 30 to 60 days out of the year, it will be available to wildlife 100% of the year. And we're gonna out of pocket that on public lands, $19,000. The state's gonna help us with $13,000. We're not a welfare case, I'm not a welfare case, okay? Uh, I work, I'll challenge anybody to outwork me, okay? We're, we're not here with our hands out. We're here trying to promote a good partnership that's been a good partnership with the DWR that has mitigated these depredation issues and has been a good investment. If we go back to the old way and these landowners go after uh, depredation mitigation the old way, the taxpayer is gonna fund it at thousands and thousands of dollars. I'll tell you right now, if uh, the DWR, or if the, the Wildlife Board approves this proposal, uh, Mark Hill from the Book Cliffs is out. He's the largest landowner there. Enefit Energy is out. Three three corners, uh, LOA's out. They will go back to the old depredation mitigation plan. Um, I came here feeling pretty optimistic. Some things transpired in this meeting via text and other things. If this rule is passed, and I think Troy and some others can, I have facilitated and partnered to on some very valuable wildlife habitat projects and situations and been able to mitigate them, including with tribal members. If the DWR pass or if the wildlife board passes this proposal, no more partnerships with the DWR, I'm out. I'm sorry, I came here feeling optimistic, but with some things that transpired, can't partner no more. Um, and so I would recommend to this board that you make a motion to the Wildlife Board, that you send a, a proposal to, a motion to the Wildlife Board, that they send this back to committee. Meet with the LOAs. I did it. I'm a volunteer rancher that helps facilitate issues, okay, and helps resolve issues. I'm passionate about ranching and I'm passionate about wildlife and habitat. I did it voluntarily. I called these folks while I was sorting cattle and hauling cattle. Okay, don't tell me it can't be done. Do it right. Chad will do it. I've talked to Chad. I facilitated with the Farm Bureau, with Chad, the landowners. I've been in contact with all of them. There's a lot of good folks. Just recommend that it goes back. Give them another chance. It, it'll work out good. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. That was the last common card. <clears throat> now we'll open. Mr. Chair, do I have a chance to clarify some things? Yeah, please do. I'll, I'll try to make it really brief. Um, if you I can just, make everything clear so we can just go straight to motion. I'd go straight to it. it. Okay, we'll, we'll try to do that. I just want to clarify. Um, it, there's been some, it seems like there's been a few comments that we tried to sneak this through. Uh, we for sure didn't try to sneak this through. Um, feels like the, the DWR has got a lot of blame for the lack of communication. Um, we had LOA representatives that we asked for them to reach out. And as you see tonight, they, they were able to reach out and rally the troops. So I don't know why they weren't able to do that at the very beginning of this process as well. So um, we, we tried to be open. We tried to have everybody involved and everybody's input involved. It wasn't our intent to try to, to sneak this through. We, we asked them to, to take it back to the LOAs so that they could get the input. So that was the intent from the very beginning. Thank you. Thank you, appreciate that, Chad. Um, before I go to public comment, or I mean to the comments from the RAC, uh, 
I, I may just want to express a couple thoughts that I'm having. I don't know if these are, uh, I, I guess, just thoughts that I'm having as I'm walking through this. Um, I also would echo what's been said. I think the there is an understanding and and the importance of the landowner. Um, I I would be surprised to find any sportsman or party involved in wildlife not recognize the benefit of private land to wildlife. Um, I think that's well recognized. I, I, I think we understand that across the board. Uh, another thought I have is, I hope that we understand that wildlife are owned by all. Um, wildlife are property of the state, of, of all parties. Um, another, another comment I would make too, is and this comments come up several times in these meetings. This is part of the public process. Uh, there's there's a lot of comments tonight that people didn't have the chance to participate. This is participation. This is the process. This is part of the process. This board here is not a decision board. We listen to you and we take our recommendation forward. So when we say we haven't had a chance to be part of the process, this is part of the process. Um, and, and I want to really clarify one more thing in that regard, because I've heard this a couple of times, and, and I don't know that it's intentional, but I think it deserves clarification. Every single member on this rack faces the public. That's who we face. We don't work for the division. We don't face the division. They don't direct us in what to do. This rack faces the public. These are your representatives, and it's a dispersed group representing different parties. And, and I hope that everybody recognizes that. So we are here to take your concerns forward and our recommendations to the board that makes the decisions. Um, I think most of us recognize that, but I think it's worth clarifying. So just a couple of thoughts that I had that have made this. So when you, when you combine those, this issue, I, I may echo Troy on this one. This is a challenging, tough issue. This system wasn't working. It was broken. And for 10 years, it surfaced that something needed to be done. And then the attempt was to do it. And everybody says, oh, the old system was awesome. <laughs> that's, that's a, we're, we're attempting to fix what people have complained about for 10 years. Help us fix it. This is the team. So uh, with that, I'm going to open it up to comments from the rack. Go ahead, Ronnie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would also like to echo many of the things that have been said first and, and foremost is um, the landowners. Um, it's been said by virtually everyone who has made a comment how important you are to wildlife and and the resources in the state of Utah and I and I echo that same sentiment. We would not be where we are as a state. We would not have what we have with our herds on any level without the landowners and uh, and I appreciate you for that. I also appreciate you showing up tonight. I also appreciate the division, just as Braden just stated. Th this is something that has been looked at and has been discussed trying to go, go forward for, for many years. And there have been a lot of people who I, I know who were approached about this and said, yes, something needs to be done, but I don't want to do it because this is going to be a hot topic. This is going to be emotionally charged because there are so many there's so much passion behind it and and so many people involved i i want to give the division some credit for for taking a stab at this i think the recommendation that they've come up with is a great shot at this this is a great attempt to fix something that's been in the works and needed to be revised and, and fixed for a long long time and i appreciate that it's hard to stand up at times, and again, I know that that's why we have this forum, but it's, it's, it's hard for me to watch these guys when they're trying to do their job and trying to, to, to figure this stuff out. They get a lot of heat. They get a lot of heat for trying to do what we've asked them to do for over 10 years, and so I, I want to recognize them and give them props for that. I think that they need that. 
that being said, I personally, I have, I have a, a few issues. I appreciate that we are trying to maintain some consistency from one end of the state to the other. I think that that is needed. Uh, I, I do think that the system has been broken for a long time, and, and I appreciate that. However, I don't know that a blanket fix is going to work. I think that with a lot of the input that we have been receiving as RAC members, that there's probably m way more involved in this than, than what we'll be able to fix with, with, with one, hey, this is, this is what we're going to do, and this is how it's going to be fixed. Um, and let's, I, I don't have a dog in the fight, and I am also a very blunt individual. There's a lot of money involved in this on all aspects of it. I have zero empathy for those that make a lot of money off of this, zero. I don't get anything out of this. I'm public Joe Hunter. I don't care on a lot of this. What I do care about is the process that happens. And if nothing else tonight, I have heartburn because there were people that should have been involved in it. And it to me, it doesn't matter where the blame falls. I don't, I don't care where the blame falls. That's, that's not the point. The point is there are people that feel like the, their voice was not heard. That is part of this process. And so I, I don't think anybody was trying to sneak anything through. I don't think that it's, it's at that point. However, I do feel like that if we move forward, that it is trying to be pushed through without without that input i'm not okay with that i don't like anybody pushing anything on me it doesn't matter if i agree with it or disagree with it that for me is enough to say we need to revisit this there there it's bigger than 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 what we think it is and so that alone just that communication with the landowners the landowner presidencies i think has to happen before that this can be moved through. I don't want to see anything pushed through. If we're going to do it, and we've been working on it for 10 years and talking about it, by damn, let's do it right. We've got the time. Let's let's figure it out. Again, I don't know that there's a right and a wrong with what's been presented other than for me, it's that communication where, where there does need to be a little bit more input. It does need to be reached out there. It doesn't matter where the blame falls. That just needs to happen before we can move forward. Um, I this goes clear back to something that Austin had said at the beginning. I do think we've mentioned this before on other items. I would suggest some way that we can get better at informing. I know um, as individuals, we can yes, we can reach out to our constituents, but we've talked about it with other topics in the past, whether it's on the website or or wherever wherever it's at, um, that we can get that information out to where there's a link or there's something in big bold letters that said, hey, these are this is what we're talking about at this time, where we don't have to have individuals who want to be involved having to search it out to figure out if there's something they need to be involved in. We we need to we need to be better at that. I don't know exactly what the answer is on that, but we need to be better about getting that information out to the individuals that need to be involved on whatever that topic is at hand. It seems like that's been a concern over the last few years on, you know, everything from antlerless to LOAs to, to everything else. We, we do need to get better about getting that information out. That's my comment. Thank you. Go ahead, Gene. Uh, I've been uh, been after uh, the DWR for some time about uh, evening things up between landowner permits and the public permits because the public has been taking one hell of a cut and the landowners weren't taking any. And the reason, let me explain as to why I see it this way. I live over in Hinkley by Delta. And I can spit from my backyard into the central region and into another hunting unit. I can drive two miles to the east and be in a third hunt, hunting unit. 
Now, if people would have uh, property there, if they, they've got the right amount of property, they might as well be lifetime license holders. They get a permit every year. The family gets permits every year. And the deer that passed over their fields two years ago didn't come from the Fillmore Paw Vant where they're going to get their tag. It didn't, they didn't come from the West Desert West. They'd had to come from clear to, from the Deep Creek Mountains if they came from deer habitat to walk on their field or the Southwest Desert, they'd had to come from Burbank. But a hundred miles to the west and 40 miles to the east. The two deer that moseyed over their field two or three years ago came from the Oak Creek unit. But they're going to get a tag every year. They're going to go up on Pioneer 50 miles away and hunt deer that have never ever seen their place. And so and when that happens year after year, while most of the public are just drawing the tag once every three years, it just don't quite go right. Now, on the other hand, I've been up there to Oak Creek, Oak City, and seen 350 head of deer on the three pivot units. And why gosh, those guys are feeding a lot of deer there. So it don't equal out. I don't know that you can make a rule that will equal out. But uh, this thing isn't, isn't quite right the way it is. And I hope we can uh, hope we can get it squared around. It's, I think it's going to take some more work to square it around. I don't think what we've got in front of us has got it squared around. But let's get it squared around before we get the damned lawyers and the damned legislature involved in it. Thanks. Thanks, Gene. Other comments? Bart. Go ahead, Bart. Um, so I think the unintended consequence of this is going to be landowners are going to drop out of the program and costs for DWR are going to go up to manage the herds on their land. Um, I also viscerally do not like the fact that landowners don't have to say in who hunts on their land. And I think until that is changed, I just can, cannot support this. Thank you. Thanks, Barb. Craig, were you reaching? I, uh, I, I think, uh, like some of have said, I think we need to. This needs to go back into discussion and involve more people into it. Uh, 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 I think a lot of us understand that the the deer wouldn't deer and elk would not be there if we weren't there taking care of them. I mean, there wouldn't be as big numbers, and so we definitely need to be compensated. But uh, anyway, uh, I think, like I say, we need to uh, table this or uh, go back into this, uh, discussions on it, or it's going to fall apart. I know you got a comment, Austin. I don't know what you're waiting for. I do have a comment. <laughs> I've scratched notes for days trying to figure this out. Um, but uh, for me, 
I think representing the public at large, yes, the, the landowners are a huge part of our public. And I've hunted long enough to know that you have to have sanctuary for some animals at least some time of the year. Some of your best hunting is going to be by a national park. It's going to be by some private land that you can't get access on. And and that's a a part of the history of Utah. And and I support that. And I thank all the landowners for everything they do, seen and unseen. I am a proponent for some sort of metric to see, as Troy stated, if it's working. Um, but I also respect the privacy. I think we need to keep that in mind with landowners. Um, yes, it is the public's wildlife, but I don't expect everything that the private landowner does to be on public record for everyone to see at all times. I think that's too much. Um, I feel like the committee process I'm new to, I'm trying to learn how this committee process works. I don't want it to be like, this is what happens, you know, behind closed doors or in a secret meeting, because it's not. Uh, but I also am facing how do you get your constituents to participate in a committee? I sit on the elk committee right now. You know, we're asked to reach out to your constituents. Well, that, that's that's a big ask. And I have felt that. So I started, I'm young enough, I started with Facebook and Instagram, you know, and got a few hundred comments there and then put my public email out there and got a few more hundred comments on how to fix elk hunting in Utah. And it's turned into a disaster. Right. But I've got a lot of really good ideas. Um, but I have sympathy for those that do sit on a committee because that is very hard uh, to come up with a plan. And I feel like whoever was on this committee and whoever participated did come up with a plan. But as soon as you tell me that, that I count 16 uh, landowner associations, that close to half of those aren't happy and they're going to drop out of the program because it doesn't work. That's a huge red flag to me um, that it just, we need some sort of landowner association advisory committee or something um, to continue on and to tweak it. I don't feel like we're creating a plan here. We're changing a rule. So with that, to me, that's a little bit different. Like an elk plan, we're creating a seven year plan. We're gonna have midterm reviews, mid plan reviews, uh, but this is a little more serious, if you will, changing a rule in my mind. So I think we could sit here till two or three in the morning and probably figure this out. We'd have to bring more of you up for comments, but I'm not really into that tonight. Um, one other comment, you know, as I've thought about uh, how New Mexico's landowner tags work in Nevada's, I do want to see some equality between public access and what the landowners get. Um, for example, when you look at like option two under this program, if you only want to hunt private lands, I don't think public hunters should go on those private lands with their public tags. I think we need to provide that. But as soon as you say you want a unit wide tag in your landowner association, I feel like that entitles some sort of public um, equality there for there to be some sort of access. I don't know how that works. And I'd like to see some better hunter management programs, some waivers, some orientations. I feel like there's more we could do than just here's Joe Blow and he gets to hunt your land. I mean, we have programs like that. Other states have programs that that work. And yeah, you might not know who the public hunter is going to be, but it's the same on the CWMU. They don't oftentimes know who the public hunter is going to be, but we have an operator. We have agreements, we have a little more structure there. And I think we need that same thing for the landowner association program. So that's my long winded comment of it definitely is not right the way it's set up, but I think it's a stepping stone and we just need to work through it, but realize it's not going to be perfect. And we're just going to have to keep changing the rule. But as soon as half the people tell me that they're not happy, like we have to do something different. Thank you. Let me add, I, I expressed some of my thoughts a minute ago. I, I want to add, I don't get to vote on this. So it is a little interesting that uh, I do want to express where I'm sitting on it, even though I won't be voting. Um, 
I think there's a real benefit. I think Utah's established this and shown success in the idea that if we if our wildlife has value, then we watch and take care of our wildlife. Uh, I think Utah's just the best success story out there of that. Look at the amount of money that we're putting on the ground from our conservation tags and other things. So I think it's very important that we continue that model and having wildlife have value for public land or I mean for private lands, that's that's why private landowners are interested in helping and working in a partnership and, and taking care of these this wildlife. Um, I think that's the attempt of this program, right? That's that's what it's been doing for a long time, and that's the attempt going forward is to keep that rolling. And and I think on that we're all in agreement. We all want that. How we get there is the problem. So uh, the other part of this is I think that or or the wildlife does not belong to the private landowner, even though they're on there eating the crops and disproportionately at times on their land. They don't belong to the private landowner. So if we're going to take tags from everybody and give them to the landowner to, to garner that support of the landowner, there, there needs to be some benefit to that public um, hunter. They, these wild, the wildlife is for all of us. And so there has to be some benefit to that public hunter. Um, and then the, the other comment I'd make is I really feel strongly that to just take percentages of land and divide that up into percentages of tags, there has to be another measure in there. Uh, I, I just, I really believe that we need to understand where the usage is and help allocate tags to the usage. Uh, if if you own a whole bunch of deer habitat and there's no deer on it, and your neighbor owns a small piece of deer habitat and all the deer on his, it, it, there needs to be some equity there. It, it needs to be divided more fair. So I think that's a component. A whole lot of rethinking, listening to what we've said today. I mean, Troy talked about the bison plan that they're working on now. At least they bring it to the Henry Mountain ranchers and the people that are in, involved that it involves so they bring it to us went over it there was extended a lot of comment and we're holding our breath and hoping that it was heard and some changes were made so when we hear see the final draft and we'll we'll know if it if it did any good but i think this deal needs to be tabled and sent back to the committee and and our comments should be taken into account and the comments from the the public and you know because uh it won't do the dwr or the public these these deer are public property but they grace our lands that kind of rubs me the wrong way but that's the way it is in utah but if you get these guys dropping out of the program, it's gonna really affect the public's price tag that they're gonna be paying for depredation and mitigation. And, and so you need to keep that in mind and, and make sure that, that that doesn't happen. That's my comment. Thanks, Bernard. Any additional comments? Are you ready for a motion, Chair? You're a brave man. <laughs> you can you can do a motion whenever you want. Let me make one more quick comment. Um, I know it's easy to say as members of society that, hey, I didn't hear about this, right? We've all said that about bills that are being passed. And I've watched way too many uh, wildlife board meetings from all across the West, um, spent way too much time listening to Senate committee meetings and House committee meetings. And it's really hard to stay up on everything, but I'll just make a comment that it is in our own duty to stay up with this. We watched the wildlife board meeting. I've got the paper right here when last time LOA permit authorizations came up and there was huge cuts because we said we're going to a, a formula based on tags. And if I remember right, the wildlife board said, 
no, we're going to pass this to a committee. We're going to keep with permit numbers as they are. This is a year and a half ago or more um, that that motion was made. And so that's why the committee was created. So I know it's very hard. We all live busy lives to stay up on all of this, but it is in our duty as citizens, as constituents to try to stay up the best we can. So yes, I'm going to push for committee transparency on the website. I want the division to put more plans and timelines so that everybody knows it's really cheap to create another web page. So we, I want to see that, but it is our duty to stay up with this the best we can. I think that's a great comment. No matter how much information you have out there, it's still you that has to find it. So go for it, Riley. I'm excited to hear this. Oh, it's it's pretty simple. I would make the motion that we reject the proposal as presented and make a recommendation that it is revisited. If there is input from the rest of the rack on on specifics of that, I would be fine with that. Okay, so the motion is to reject as presented in order to revisit the proposal. Correct. Okay, do you have a second on that? I just wanted to ask a question. So you're <clears throat> you're rejecting every every component of it, or there's just one, there's some parts, or you just want more participation, or I guess because I would propose that we accept with the caveat that they go back and I mean so. Is this an appropriate procedure? I don't know. Um, that's in the motion. You're fine. Okay. Yeah. Once there's a second, we will need to vote on it. But uh, yeah, so I wanted to stop the second before we the vote. I got a question on the, 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 the I brought up about the landowner thing. Do you want to? You've got to go to the state board. Do you, how do you want to handle that one? Do you want because of, there's just that one section? I you know and. Okay, so you can add you can add an amendment to his motion. Okay, if to, that's how you want to do it, to, to, to drop that one. But if he rejects the entire thing, then yeah. you get to bring that up already. Yeah, that's what I want to say. <laughs> you want to have the, the different sections. You want to handle the whole thing together. That's well, we we have a motion right now to reject in its entirety, and if that gets a second, we will vote on it. If that fails, then we'll entertain other motions. We have a second, so Vernon seconds as, so the motion stands, we'll need to make a vote now. Okay, uh, so so let me, so I've got the, yeah. the motion as to reject the proposal as presented and recommend that the proposal be revisited just by the committee or just revisited, what does revisited mean? Do you wanna clarify that, Riley? Um, yes, I would, I would like, um, well, with everything that we talked about, I, I I don't I don't know how to form that in the motion, but that all of the individuals that that information is out there. My the biggest issue with me rejecting that is that the individuals that should have been involved were not involved. Those that wanted to have that voice, whether um, lack of their own part or lack of information getting out there, they were not involved, and they need to be before this gets pushed forward. So revisited in order to gather more input? Yes, that, that works. Verlin, you're good with that addition on the end of that. Revisited. Yeah. So it's written as to reject the proposal as presented and recommend that the proposal be revisited in order to gather more input. You're seconding that motion? Okay. So I, I just have a motion. question. Yeah, go ahead, Chad. So whose input, just the landowners or do you want all of the sportsman's groups as well? Because we've heard from one constituency a whole lot tonight, but we haven't heard from the other. And how are we gonna get them notice as well? Because their voices are just as important as the landowners in this. No, I agree with that. From all sides, in order to gather more input from from all, do you want me to add that to the to the motion? If there if there is a simpler motion, 
we can totally take that one off my, the table. I'm my sorry, thought yeah, there, but... Kevin, just adding my two cents, is I think that motion, I, I don't think we want to add a lot of words to it. I think we'll confuse it more. I to think. gather more input, I, probably. Just I think so. Else. Yeah, okay. I think so. I think I think that motion can stand. I think the intent of that motion is clear from everybody that's affected. I think that's that Correct. would be the assumption by from the motion. Okay. I have just a clarification. You didn't want to divide up the general season buck deer, which we've heard very little comment on from the landowner association program. And could those easily be distinguished in the rule? Chad, is that a fair question? Yeah, I, I think we we could get representation from both. Uh, like we could get just some landowners on general season units and we could get LOA people. Chad, I think what he's asking is if they just passed the land or the general season oh. part of it and rejected the, the 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 limited entry part of it, could we deal with that in the in terms of implementing? I think the, the answer is probably yes. Yeah, I would say so. Well, that was what my point was. Is way, you know, there's not a lot of controversy on it other than that one thing on the general season part. We could pass, you know, if that amendment, we could pass that one, that part of it, couldn't we? With some adjustments. With that one amendment, yeah. So if you did that, Riley would have Riley's motion would have to be specific to the landowner association portion of the rule. You guys are making my motion really hard. <laughs> I, one, one other, not, let me just make a comment here. I, I am not stating whether I'm for or against Riley's motion. In fact, I, I legitimately am kind of thinking on this. But I think if we're going to revisit this, my thought is revisit the whole thing and accept the whole thing in its entirety. I, I think it's weird to break this up. That, that that was the idea with with the motion to revisit the the whole thing i think it needs work and i would i would like more input on the on the the whole thing i i think that there's a lot of yeah don't we don't need to get into it just another comment i think that there's a lot of information that's in this that's not out there that people aren't aware of in general that i would like to see out there to try to get some input back on before we move forward. Any additional discussion? Are we ready to vote? Okay, let's vote on the motion. Uh, let's do this by, what's the proper term for roll call? Roll call. Just roll call, I got it right? Yeah. Okay, let's start down there with you, Nick. Here, let me yeah. get, get, let me get the- Yes, yeah. Gene, yes, Chuck. Thank you. Yes. Dan. Yes. Berlin. Yes. Austin. Yes. I'm sure glad because I can already say I don't have to be a tiebreaker, so I'm already off the hook. Craig. Yeah. Riley. Yes. Bart. Yes. I think you said yes. Okay. And Chad. Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Okay. Appreciate everyone being here tonight. Appreciate you bearing with us. That uh, I know, I, I'm getting there. <laughs> I just know that the room's gonna clear out right now. I'm just being real here. You're all welcome to stay for the next item and I know none of you are going to. So I wanna just express, uh, appreciate you for being here. This, this took a long time. I hope everyone felt heard. Um, thank you. And thank you for coming and being part of the process. That's this, this process does work if we work it. You guys have to be here for the process to work. So thank you. And the final item on the agenda. So we're gonna go over the Big Nail Bottoms WA, Big Nail Bottoms WMA HMP the Habitat Management Plan, and that's by Gary. Gary, you know how to clear a room, man. <laughs> Don't take this personal, but there's no one left. <laughs> you leaving too? I might. There's just some information. There's no more. You're leaving? We'll, we'll see you tomorrow. Okay, sounds good.
Yeah. Even you guys believe that. Yeah. Yeah. Long drive. They might get after me though. <laughs> as soon as the last person leaves the room, we'll give away the door prizes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah like about 15 years ago we were flying seed on the milford flat fire like seven semi loads of it 50 pound bag at a time into the airplane we got down to that last bag that was the best bag right so um yeah thank you <laughs> So uh, my name is Gary Bezin. I'm the Habitat Program Manager for the Southern Region. Um, this this was a, a great opportunity to be here tonight. I, I really enjoyed and a good educational opportunity. Um, was planning to summarize to you the, the committee experience that I had. Not sure I want to tell you about that we had a committee involved with this that we did not invite Berlin King from Bicknell to be part of. <laughs> no. So yeah, we did. We did have a committee actually. So let's 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 get serious now. Um, the Bicknell Bottoms Habitat Management Plan. Uh, we have a waterfowl management area over there in Bicknell. Uh, very well loved by by sportsmen over there for a lot of reasons. Waterfowl hunters, pheasant hunters, fishermen really really enjoyed property. Really heavily used property, um, and it was just time to to revise that plan. And we put together our state code tells us that we should use a public involvement process. And we did put together a committee. I went to every door in the town of Bicknell, knocked on them and asked them if they wanted to be involved. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but um, we, Too had some early. Too early, Gary. <laughs> we had some people crash the party. I appreciated what Berlin said about that actually. And we did have some people crash the party and provide valuable input. I think it's a good, good point that um, committees can be, can be challenging, um, but we had a very good committee that put, together a lot of effort. Um, that was some other things you guys pointed out. Committees can can put a lot of effort into things um, and ultimately came up with a plan that we put out there that hopefully met the needs and demands of a lot of people. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of well, I stated that the sportsmen love that area. There's a lot of good local people there too that have been in that area for a long time and have got a lot of history with that Bicknell Bottoms area and how it is is used and has been used. And we tried to gather thoughts from all those people um, and ultimately came up with a plan uh, with some key components. I'll just list real quick. Uh, one of the ideas is that they wanted to see water conveyed through the WMA a little quicker. We're looking for some answers to that. It's not easy. There's a lot of permitting requirements uh, through Army Corps of Engineers and different things, but we, we found a vegetation management system that we're going to try that doesn't require permitting, that we're going to do some uh, spraying out corridors in the cattails to try to keep, keep that water moving through the WMA a little bit. Uh, wanted to increase access to other sides of Pine Creek. We're going to be putting in some footbridges. We're going to be putting in some parking areas um, and just trying to make it a better better area. One of the really cool things that's happened with Bicknell Bottoms over 10 years, uh, the story I like to tell is 10 years ago, I had a, my son had a cow elk permit over there and we, we went and hunted, shot his cow elk in the morning, um, had some time. So we got a sandwich at Royals there in, in Loa. Then we hunted pheasants there in Bicknell in the afternoon. Um, had the place to ourselves a Saturday afternoon 10 years ago and had a great time, shot a few pheasants, and then we were fishing at Fish Lake by the end of the day. It was a great day. Um, contrast that to this past season, Jim Lamb, one of my biologists that works over there, said that on a Wednesday he went to try to go pheasant hunting there and was sharing the property with 30 other hunters. So it's it's grown in demand and use and love over there. People really enjoy using that property, and it's been an exciting thing to watch. And because of that, we've been able to put together a plan that hopefully can accommodate a lot more use over there, expand the pheasant hunting opportunities, make things better for the waterfowl hunters, make things better for the fishermen, and also make things better for the, the adjacent landowners and downstream water users. With that, I'll throw it to comments and questions. I'll just point out, um, and maybe you saw this on Gary's presentation. So this has been, this is the last part of this process. So this this WMA plan or habitat management plan um, was presented to the Wayne County Commission, um, and and was re, was uh, got a favorable favorable comments from them. It's been through the Habitat Council, and it's been through what's called the RDCC process. So so here tonight we're kind of the last of of several. 
Um, uh, and RDCC is again. currently going on with closing on the May 25th. So yeah, and that's the that's a process together. that goes to all the federal partners, all the counties, all the it, it's a it casts a, a broad net, and it's been well received in throughout the process. So. It, and I understand this is informational, so I am just curious to hear what input did the county over there give changes if any accommodations if any that's that's in all honesty a deep question the county was involved with the committee we had a county commissioner very involved so um i like the way Ke kevin summarized it by the time we were done with the plan the county was happy with where we were at they they definitely did have some input and felt like there were some things we were probably not doing appropriately with the property and we tried to find some good middle ground. One of the biggest things was the water conveyance. So they the were involved all the way along. So they once were you were done, the they were bought in at that yeah. point. It, right. It's also probably needs to be said that it was frustration from the county that that helped push us into the process of rewriting the, the habitat management plan too. So that, that that's fair to, to put out there for sure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> one of the county commissioners never wanted to be recorded either so <laughs> yeah i'll second that we i mean the county commissioners and and the ranchers in the Bicknell bottoms has had a problem with that water backing up and cattail overgrowth and it's we've lost a lot of uh grazing because of that because of what we think is probably mismanagement of the of the property because you bought it and then you just left it and then uh i didn't really think like your presentation all the great things you did you you burned it well you burned it because we about just made you do it i mean we fought and fought and tried to get you to burn it uh this the comment on grazing i i know of one committee that from the that uh put in an application they say and uh whether for some reason it didn't get all the way through when you were opening that one thing for grazing the one little thing last last fall and then it's kind of funny that a few years ago when you let the the permittee that was on the henry's graze your land for a month uh -huh. you you wouldn't use this i mean he couldn't couldn't put a, a cow and calf on it you made him take them all off and and just run cows and that doesn't work when you try to it's, count buffalo the yeah. same as it, it's a tricky thing berlin and i appreciate the comments and and it's a tricky thing to understand the conversations that have happened between individuals um there was a lot of discussion about whether or not to use AUMs versus head in that permit. And it was decided with David Brinkerhoff to, to use head. And he just did not understand when we, when we, it was just a miscommunication. Um, and yeah, was, was an unfortunate miscommunication. Yeah. Well, and, and I could have written the permit either way. I had no problem with it, but felt right. like I had done it the way. Yeah. Was well, intended. and that's, we run pairs. We don't I understand. run head. So yeah. And all, all my other permits are actually in AUMs, and that was a, a weird thing that I, that I had did it on under head, and it was based on the understanding that that's what we thought was wanted. So, so. any other questions or comments from the rack? Again, this is informational. So, uh, could you just uh, briefly explain the the water? Uh, the the flow what is it the Fremont River so yeah there's there's two different uh systems that, that well there's a lot of different systems briefly explaining the water there's a a tricky thing but um Fremont River runs through the north side of the property Pine Creek runs through the south side of the property and then there's probably over a hundred different springs that contribute to the system anywhere in between those two rivers and so the the, the big issue with the water was um it's a fairly sediment driven system. There's been a lot of sediment that's made it through with flash floods and different things. And over time, water has backed up. It's a very flat area. So obviously that's where sediment wants to deposit. And because 
things weren't done in a timely manner. And it, it can be debated whether it should have been done on our property or on the private property adjacent to us. But to, to keep those channels open, it definitely has spread the water out. And we're gonna do make some efforts to try to create corridors for that water to move again. Um, but there are also some very specific things now with it being a wetland uh, to permit uh, if we were to dredge or to, to rechannelize it using a back of track essentially, it requires a heavy level of permitting. It would be very expensive, very extensive, uh, take a lot of time. And we committed in the plan to doing that if this vegetation management corridor stuff doesn't work out, um, that we would pursue those permits, but there's no guarantee that those permits will ever be approved, or if they are approved, that they will be in a, a financial way that is feasible to accomplish. Right. Yeah, you, you talk about sediment. See, the pioneers that wasn't Big No Bottom. That was Red Lake. Yep, it was a lake, and probably a pretty substantial one. But over the over the years, it's it's just said the sediment has just filled it up, and now it's yep. growing. Yeah, and that the reason it being Red Lake is why that whole area is so flat because the the sediment filled that in. There's a lot of history there. We could go into a lot of detail. It's it's 10 o'clock though. So, but Berlin, I would love to at some point visit with you more about it though, and look at the aerial photos and talk about the history and getting your perspective as well. So, all right, are we ready to adjourn? Yes. Make sure that uh, if you didn't turn in your conflict of interest forms on the back of that, it's asking for your signature to sign that and turn that in to Kevin if you would. Um. Next RAC meeting is August 2nd, so get a little break for a little bit. We need a little break. This has been a rough year, so uh, with that, we'll adjourn. Thank you. I, I, I do hope we see some of you at the meeting in Cedar tomorrow night and then back here on the 24th for the, for the deer um, listening.